Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, today we are very happy to have uh, Nina Holden from ETH Zurich, and she's going to tell us about Liouville quantum gravity in probability theory. So the mathematical um, side of Liouville gravity. Over to you, Nina. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So I'll start sharing my screen. Okay, so let's yeah, now you can see my screen, I think. Uh, okay, so um, uh, first I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to give a talk in the seminar. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, Liouville quantum gravity uh, in uh, probability theory. Uh, so I'm working in uh, math myself and uh, not in physics, and I was told that uh, most of the people attending the seminar are not so familiar with uh, the progress uh, done in, in the math literature on uh, Liouville quantum gravity or uh, LQG. Uh, conversely, I am not so uh, familiar with uh, the physics side myself, so I'd be very happy to uh, hear what sort of uh, thoughts uh, and reactions you have to what I will be saying, and if you have some uh, additional perspectives coming from the physics point of view. Uh, so in probability theory, um, Liouville quantum gravity refers to a theory of uh, random surfaces. Uh, in the past uh, 10 to 15 years, uh, there have been developed uh, two different uh, probabilistic uh, directions on uh, LQG. Uh, the first direction is uh, random planar uh, geometry. Uh, so the motivation in random planar geometry is not only coming from physics, uh, it's also an interest uh, to understand uh, better um, random objects or random surfaces, uh, which are viewed as uh, particularly uh, natural uh, or uh, what we call uh, universal uh, random, uh, random objects. Uh, in random planar uh, geometry, uh, then uh, one is interested in understanding surfaces uh, that describe uh, the scaling limit of uh, discrete uh, random surfaces known as uh, random planar maps. Uh, a particularly fruitful uh, direction in random planar geometry is to study uh, interactions between uh, LQG surfaces and particular random fractal curves uh, that are known as uh, schramm lerner evolutions uh, or uh, SLE. Uh, Lee will confirm a field theory, or uh, LCFT, uh, is the other direction. Uh, so this is based on uh, a rigorous implementation of uh, the path integral approach, uh, which is going back to, to Paul Lyakov. Uh, in Lee will confirm a field theory, one is particularly interested in understanding uh, correlation functions, uh, and these have been uh, rigorously defined uh, and uh, computed. Uh, so these two uh, approaches, random planar geometry and uh, LCFT, uh, they are uh, mathematically equivalent in the sense that the random uh, objects and random surfaces that are defined, uh, they are uh, the same. Uh, so this is far from obvious because the two uh, approaches are actually uh, quite, uh, quite different. Uh, but there have been several uh, recent works which have proven uh, such uh, equivalence uh, results. Uh, so I worked uh, mostly on uh, the random planar uh, geometry my, myself, uh, and, uh, and the majority of the talk will be about uh, this. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the talk, I will also uh, briefly present uh, LCFT, uh, and, I will, and I will explain what I mean when I say that uh, these two approaches are uh, mathematically uh, equivalent. Uh, so I start by presenting the random uh, conformal geometry, and I start by uh, asking a motivating question. Um, so this this question uh, uh, this question is uh, how can you sample a path uniformly at uh, at random? Um, so to answer this question, uh, we first need to specify what we mean by a path. Uh, for example, we can say that the path is a continuous function from R plus uh, to R. Uh, and then uh, afterwards, we need to put some uh, natural uh, probability measure on this set of, of paths. Uh, so one natural uh, way to approach the problem uh, is to discretize it. Uh, so a simple random walk, uh, it is a random walk which is going either up by one or down by one at, e at each uh, integer time. Uh, and it is defined such that uh, the different steps are independent and they are uniformly distributed on uh, plus minus one. Uh, so if we look at the first n steps of the walk, uh, then there are two to the power n uh, possible, uh, possibilities, um, and uh, each of these are equally likely, uh, and therefore it's natural to view the simple random walk uh, as a uniformly sampled uh, path. Uh, so here I have rescaled time uh, by n, uh, and I have rescaled space uh, by uh, space by uh, root n. Uh, and then it is a classical result uh, that if we do this rescaling and we send n to infinity, uh, then uh, the simple random walk uh, is converting the scaling limit to the random fractal curve known as uh, a Brownian motion. Uh, so Brownian motion, it is uh, a random uh, fractal curve, which is arising in a huge number of settings. Uh, it used to model everything from financial markets to a number of uh, physical uh, phenomena. 
Uh, one reason the random motion is uh, arising in so many settings uh, is universality, which means that it uh, arises as a large class of discrete uh, models, uh, typically independently of the details uh, of the model. Uh, we also say that Brownian motion is a canonical example of, of a random path. Uh, and the reason for this is that uh, Brownian motion is uniquely characterized uh, by uh, certain natural uh, symmetries and, uh, and properties. Uh, so in this talk, we will be uh, interested in uh, universal and canonical uh, random uh, surfaces. Uh, and we start by asking uh, the question, how can you sample a surface uh, uniformly at, at random? Uh, so again, a natural approach uh, to the problem is to discretize it. Um, in the figure, you can see um, a planar map, uh, which has been sampled uniformly at random from some finite collection of, uh, of planar maps. Uh, and this is uh, our model for, uh, for a uniformly sampled uh, surface. Uh, so to be more precise, uh, a planar map is a graph uh, which has been drawn on the sphere and which is viewed modular continuous deformations. Uh, for example, uh, the middle and the left uh, planar maps in the figure, they are considered to be the same since we can get one from the other by applying a continuous deformation. Uh, the middle and uh, the right planar maps, uh, on the other hand, uh, they are not uh, considered to be the same. Uh, for, some some, for some natural number n, uh, there are finitely many maps which have exactly uh, n uh, edges. Um, and we get our uniform surface by sampling uh, such uh, uh, by sampling a planar map uh, uniform at random from, from such a finite collection of uh, planar maps. Uh, so planar maps have been studied in many different uh, branches of both math and, and physics. Uh, so in math, uh, the study of planar maps goes at least back to the combinatorics literature in the 60s, uh, when Tut, Mullen and, and others were interested in counting or enumeration formulas for planar maps. Uh, later, they have been studied in, for example, uh, geometry and uh, random matrix theory. Uh, one application which is relevant for us is in random uh, geometry, where um, uh, where probabilists are interested in, in, in understanding the ge geometry of large uh, random planar maps. Uh, another application which is relevant for us is in conformal field theory and uh, string theory, where, um, uh, where random planar maps are viewed as models for uh, random surfaces. Uh, in this figure, you can see um, a simulation of, uh, of uh, a random uh, planar map, um, which has been sampled uniform at random from some finite collection of, uh, of planar maps. Uh, so since a planar map, it's only defined modulo continuous uh, deformations, uh, so there's not a unique uh, correct way to draw it. Uh, and in this figure, uh, the, uh, when drawing the planar map, uh, one has applied uh, an optimization procedure uh, where one has um, favored uh, maps. Uh, where uh, the length of uh, adjacent vertices or, or the length of the various edges uh, is not uh, too different. Uh, so one natural question uh, is whether this uh, planar map is converging in some sense uh, when the size of the planar map is going to infinity. Uh, and uh, there have been established uh, several uh, different such convergence results. Uh, and I will be presenting one such result, uh, which is convergence under uh, a conformal embedding. Sorry, Nina, a uh, naive question. Yeah. So when you say okay. uh, this is sampled uniformly at random, like I, li I can imagine just listing out all planar graphs with n edges and then just choosing one at random. So it's just like some discrete number of. Yeah, exactly, exactly, okay. exactly. Uh, yeah, so that's uh, that's exactly exactly what is done. Uh, so okay. um, yeah, there are finitely many maps which have exactly n edges. One can list everyone and mm -hmm. uh, then sample one uniform at random. Okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, a small uh, remark, which I was not planning to come back to uh, until later, is that in this particular case, one has actually restricted uh, to planar maps uh, where the faces are triangles. Uh, so if you look on the figure, you can see that all the faces are triangles. Um, yeah, uh, but essentially all the asymptotic results that I will present today are not really dependent on a particular choice of planar map. Okay. Yeah, no, thanks for the question. Um, uh, okay, so um, uh, so in order to describe what it means that uh, a planar map is converging under uh, conformal embedding, uh, I, uh, I will first explain uh, uh, that one can view a planar map uh, as, um, uh, as a Riemannian manifold. Uh, so we're now considering uh, planar maps, uh, which are uh, triangulation. So as I just explained, this means uh, planar maps where all uh, faces have exactly three uh, edges. Uh, and then one can give each face uh, the metric of the standard equilateral uh, triangle. Uh, so, no, so in other words, one has a collection of standard equilateral triangles and one glue these uh, together uh, in order to uh, form um, a manifold. 
so this manifold will be uh, smooth uh, away from um, uh, the vertices uh, of the triangles. Uh, and uh, at the vertices, uh, one will have a conical uh, singularity uh, uh, unless the number of triangles meeting is exactly uh, six. Uh, so there is a result known as the uniformization uh, theorem, uh, which is saying that if one has some simply connected Riemann surface, uh, then there is a conformal map uh, phi from this uh, Riemann surface to either uh, the unit disk, uh, the complex plane, uh, or the sphere. Uh, so by this result, since the planar map uh, has spherical topology, we know that uh, there will be uh, a conformal map which takes our planar map uh, and to, uh, to the sphere uh, S2. Uh, so in, uh, in this figure, um, I've illustrated one such conformal embedding. Uh, so this, is, uh, this simulation is due to Nicola uh, Curian. Uh, so in this figure, uh, you can see uh, one planar map, uh, which has been drawn in two different ways. Uh, so the left part of the figure, the planar map has been drawn uh, just as we saw it, uh, before. Uh, in the right part of the figure, on the other hand, uh, this uh, planar map has been uh, conformally embedded uh, into uh, the sphere. Uh, so when we embed the planar map uh, into the sphere, uh, then we get an error measure, um, u sub n, uh, and a distance function or metric, uh, d sub n, uh, on uh, the sphere. Uh, the error measure, uh, it is defined by uh, considering a rescale counting measure on, on the vertices. Um, so we say that each vertex of the map, it has a mass, uh, one divided by n. Uh, and we say that uh, the mass of some uh, subset of the sphere uh, is equal to the mass of the vertices contained uh, in this set. Uh, we also have uh, a distance function or metric, which is defined by considering rescaled uh, graph distances. Um, and so this is defined, um, so this gives us a way to define the distance between any pairs of points on the, on the sphere. Uh, so if we're given to arbitrary points uh, on the sphere, uh, then in order to uh, calculate the distance, uh, then we first uh, find the embedded vertices that, that are closest to these two points. Uh, and then uh, we compute uh, the rescale graph distance between uh, these two points. Uh, so in rescaling the graph distance, it turns out uh, that it's natural uh, to rescale um, the distances such that um, uh, adjacent uh, vertices have distance uh, n to the power uh, minus uh, a quarter. Uh, so this is natural because uh, it turns out that um, uh, that, this, that if one does uh, this rescaling, uh, then the total diameter uh, of the sphere uh, will be of order one uh, when uh, the size n of the planar map uh, is going to uh, infinity. Uh, could you? So, sorry, this is going a little bit fast for me. Could you go? Could you explain again um, how the con conformal embedding of the planar map it, is determined? Um, so, so in general, there are actually several methods someone can use. Uh, the one uh, I was um, uh, I was describing here, it's building on this uh, uniformization theorem. Uh, so, uh, by gluing together the triangles um, according to the combinatorial structure of the planar map. So here we have uh, the planar map, uh, which the planar map which can be obtained by gluing together these triangles. And uh, the surface we get when gluing together these triangles, uh, it uh, it will be uh, a Riemannian manifold. Uh, and there is uh, a general result which is saying that if one has uh, a Riemann surface, then one can um, then one can um, th then there is a conformal map uh, from uh, which sends uh, this uh, um, this surface to to one of these uh, three domains. Uh, so this is uh, how uh, how the embedding is done. And to start out with, are the triangles all the same? Uh, yeah, exactly. So uh, it's just uh, the standard metric on the equilateral triangle. So just imagine that you have just the, the regular metric on the equilateral triangle. Um, uh, okay. Yeah, just, so that's yeah. okay. Okay. It, it, where, where each edge, for example, has length one. Okay. And then there's a unique map or unique. Uh, so there's actually um, so there's uh, so you need so there are somehow you have three degrees of freedom. Uh, when you do uh, when you do the embedding, but if you, for example, if you uh, fix three points uh, on the manifold and you um, and you require or you have some uh, you um, you determine to which points on the sphere to send these three points, uh, then and then there is a unique map. Then one has both existence uh, and uniqueness. Okay, and then then the next step was n the number of edges or what was uh, it? so n is the number of edges. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and then it's natural to do uh, this rescaling because it turns out that the number of, um, of vertices is, uh, is proportional to the number of edges. Uh, I mean, as in, in, probabilistically, uh, it, uh, it is proportional. 
Uh, so therefore, if one gives each uh, vertex mass one over n, uh, then uh, the total mass uh, of the sphere uh, will be a order one uh, when n is going to infinity. What is the significance of the mass? Uh, so, um, so we're interested in understanding uh, random surfaces, uh, and uh, and if one has um, uh, like a random, uh, so in general, if 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 one has a random surface, for example, a Riemannian manifold, then one can define like uh, one can define uh, areas, uh, distances, uh, and and so on. Uh, so we somehow we want to view this as um, as a random uh, as a random surface. Uh, one could have done it differently. Yeah. Uh, we could also have done it differently. So one could also have said that uh, since we're dealing with uh, with like we have viewed it as a very many manifold, one could also say that one just rescales the area measure given by each uh, triangle. So if we go back, we assume that these are um, uh, standard equilateral uh, triangles, maybe with uh, length one. So then the total area of this is also going to be some uh, like a number of order one, uh, and one could also have assigned uh, just uh, this measure to this to this triangle. So there are somehow there are several ways to do it, but the but the belief is that the, the exact way in which one defines a mass doesn't matter asymptotically. I think I just confused about the terminology mass. Like, what does the I understand okay. this is like a geometric thing having to do with lengths and areas. But what is the mass? Ah, uh... uh, so it's uh, so it's actually the area measure. Ah. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Maybe that was confusing. I'm sorry. Uh, so it's it's basically. Uh, so we're just saying that. Um, uh, so it's just uh, so we have an error measure. Um, so it's just um, if one is given any subset of the sphere, uh, it assigns a measure to that to that set. And you assign it based on the vertices, not the face. exactly. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank exactly. You. Yeah. Thank you for all yeah. the explanations. Yeah. yeah. No. But thanks. Thanks for thanks for the questions. Okay. Ask a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, what's the meaning of those uh, vertex that uh, only have one edge? The previous uh, um, triangularization, all the vertex have multiple edges, right? Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, so I wouldn't say there's any, it's just in general when one sample, when sampling a planar map at random, then uh, then there will typically be some, uh, some uh, vertices that only have one edge. Uh, uh, what that what yeah. does it mean for the triangularization of of the sphere? Uh, so asymptotically, it actually doesn't matter. Uh, so that's somehow uh, okay. one of the um, uh, one of the things, one of the results, which at least to to a big extent has been rigorously proved as well, is that all these local constraints uh, they don't really matter in um, uh, they don't really matter in uh, in the scaling limit. Uh, so if one considers uh, planar maps, uh, or if one considers random triangulations, if one, if there are certain uh, local so certain local behaviors that one doesn't allow, uh, then in the scaling limit, it actually doesn't matter for the limiting uh, geometry. Oh, okay, so if I try to uh, think what what this figure represents for the triangularization, I could just remove those uh, vertex with only one edge. Feel yeah, I think actually for the limiting, uh, for the scaling, uh, for the limiting behavior, then uh, this uh, it shouldn't matter. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Uh -huh. uh, also, another question. So you you just said that the mass is the area, but how it can yeah. scale differently with the length? The length you scale uh, yeah. with n to the minus uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is uh, um, so this is it's somehow far from obvious that one should have this rescaling. It's far from obvious that one. I mean, if one works in Euclidean space, then normally one would, uh, if one rescales areas by n, then typically one would rescale lengths by n to the power minus a quarter. Um, so one would have two here instead of four. Uh, but it turns out that, that in these random uh, planar maps, in order to get an non-trivial behavior, then one should actually uh, rescale by uh, by a quarter here instead of uh, instead of a half. So that means the, the, the triangle is not on the uh, on the flat geometry, it's like some curved geometry to obey this relation between area and length. Right. Yeah, so it is it's, it is a very special it is a very special uh, geometry. It's somehow um, yeah, you can see here that there are lots of small like lots of small like bottlenecks, um, which uh, which somehow um, I mean, although it's, it's planar, it's still, um, yeah, you can see that there are some, some areas here where we're embedding, there are some, 
eras where there are like lots and lots of uh, uh, of um, like vertices very very close together. So it has it is very it is a very fractal structure. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, I, yeah. I understand. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, okay, so if there are no uh, more questions, I will uh, I will continue. Um, okay, so um, uh, so it is believed that for uh, a large class of, uh, of planet maps, um, uh, then this uh, okay sorry uh, then this uh, error measure mu uh, and also this uh, metric uh, or distance function uh, d uh, or mu sub n and, and d sub n uh, that these two uh, that this measure and this uh, metric uh, converge in, in in the scaling limit. Uh, to a limiting uh, measure and uh, a limiting uh, metric. And so this limiting measure are denoted by mu and the limiting uh, metric uh, are denoted by uh, by d. Uh, so um, uh, so mu and d, uh, they are both uh, random uh, and it is believed uh, that for a large class of, uh, of random planet maps, then, uh, this, uh, then, uh, then the limiting measure mu and the limiting metric d, uh, they define uh, the geometry of, of these random surfaces that are known as uh, LQG uh, surfaces. Uh, so, uh, so this is uh, in general, it is a conjecture, uh, conjecture but it has been uh, proved in, in one special case. Uh, so it has uh, been proved in the special case uh, when the planet map uh, is a triangulation, uh, and it has been proved uh, in a special case when, uh, when, um, uh, when uh, the embedding uh, is something we, we call uh, the cardi embedding. Uh, so if we go back, um, uh, so, uh, so far, when I define a control embedding, that, then I apply this uh, uniformization theorem. Uh, but in this uh, theorem, which has been rigorously proved, uh, then one is actually applying uh, another uh, embedding rule uh, when, uh, when considering uh, the convergence. Uh, so one is considering an embedding rule, which we call uh, the Cardi embedding. Um, and this is uh, based on uh, considering uh, percolation observables uh, on the planar map. Um, so, uh, so also, so, uh, so this theorem was proved in collaboration with um, Shinsun, uh, and it's, um, uh, but it is based on uh, a number of uh, works of uh, also of, of other people. Uh, it's not the first convergence result uh, for uh, random planar maps. Uh, for example, uh, random convergence results have also been proved earlier by uh, Logal uh, Mirmont, by uh, Dupont, Thea Miller, and Sheffield, and by uh, Gwyn and uh, Anne Miller. Uh, but this result is uh, the first convergence result, uh, which is giving a uh, convergence under uh, a conformal embedding. Uh, these other results are considering other notions of uh, convergence. Sorry, so uh, okay. the Cardi embedding is a special case of the conformal embedding or? Uh, it's actually a little bit different. So it's, um, uh, so it's rather uh, defined by considering percolation uh, observables on the planar map. Um, so I'm not sure if I, I should go into details because it would okay. take it would take a bit of time to explain exactly how it is defined, um, but it's actually a it's actually a rather a different uh, convergence. Um, it's actually okay. a somewhat different type of embedding. Uh, okay. It's based on a somewhat in a somewhat different philosophy, at least. Uh, okay. So it's um, uh, it's, it's based on considering like percolation, so a statistical physical model on uh, on uh, the planar map, and then somehow uh, look at the crossing probabilities for the statistical physical model, and then somehow based on uh, considering like crossing probabilities for the statistical physical model, then somehow use this to guess to which points on the sphere the different vertices should be uh, should be mapped. I see, and also this exponent one quarter probably depends on yeah. like in the physics language you consider these two comma p minimal CFTs coupled to Liouville CFT. So this yeah. is for yeah. some particular value of that p parameter. Yeah, exactly. So this is um, so this is the case when so we're we're often talking about like a, a Liouville central charge, a matter central charge, and a background charge. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, so this is a special case when uh, so the matter central charge is zero, okay. and the Liouville central charge is is twenty six. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and we also have uh, I think it's called coupling constant, which is square root of eight thirds. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, and, and it's true, as you said, that uh, this exponent, uh, a quarter, it, it, it does depend on this. Uh, I will come back to this later, that the exact relationship is actually, in general, it's not known how this exponent depends on the central charge. It's only known in, in this very particular case. Um,
Okay, so uh, the next thing I want to do is to introduce uh, Liouville quantum uh, gravity uh, and uh, or what we mean by Liouville quantum gravity surface. And uh, in order to do that, uh, I first need to introduce the Gaussian free field. Uh, and I'd start by considering uh, the discrete uh, Gaussian free field. Uh, so, um, uh, so here uh, in the figure, I have um, considered a rescale version of, of Z2 uh, restricted to the unit square, uh, such that adjacent function values um, uh, so that uh, adjacent uh, points have distance uh, 1 over n. Uh, so then if one uh, has a function defined on, on this graph, uh, then one can define uh, the Hamiltonian uh, by considering the sum of uh, squared uh, differences uh, between uh, adjacent uh, function values. Uh, so in other words, uh, the Hamiltonian is going to be uh, smaller if we consider a function where adjacent function, where adjacent function values are not uh, too different. Uh, so then I define uh, the discrete Gaussian free field. Uh, so the discrete Gaussian free field, it is uh, a function sampled at random uh, on, uh, on this uh, graph, uh, such that it has been sampled, uh, such that um, uh, what we call the rado nictum derivative relative to the product of uh, Lebesgue measure is given by, uh, is given by the product of uh, Lebesgue measure uh, on, on, each, uh, on each vertex. Uh, so in other words, words in order to uh, switch the function defined on, on this graph, uh, and in order to sample it, one can imagine that one first sample a point from a uh, Lebesgue measure independently at each, uh, at each site, uh, and then one uh, reweights the measure uh, by e to the power uh, minus uh, this Hamiltonian. Uh, so in other words, it is a function which has been sampled uh, at random, uh, but where one is uh, favoring uh, functions where adjacent function values are not uh, too different. Um, so in order for this to make sense, uh, as we know that of course the big measure it is it is an infinite measure. Uh, so in order to um, to make sense to to make sense of uh, of this discrete Gaussian free field um, as a probability measure and not as an infinite uh, measure, uh, then one needs to introduce some additional constraints. Uh, so for example, one can uh, introduce the additional constraint uh, that uh, the average value of uh, the function is equal uh, to zero. Uh, so for, uh, from this definition uh, of uh, the discrete Gaussian free field, uh, one can deduce that if one considers some fixed point uh, z in, in the square, uh, and one considers the value of the function at, at this point, uh, then this will be a normal random variable. Uh, so it will be a normal uh, random variable, which has a mean zero and which has a variance of order uh, log n. Uh, there is also some covariance between uh, the function values at different points. Uh, so if we have two points z and w in the unit, uh, in unit square, uh, then the covariance between the values at z and w will be uh, will be uh, of order the logarithm of the inverse distance uh, between uh, the two points. Uh, are there any questions to this uh, to this before I uh, before I continue? So translating into physics language, we would say that the second equation is the two point function of a scalar field in two D, right? That's the yeah, logarithm yeah. with the exactly. Exactly. and yeah. the first equation is somehow encoding the fact that we usually say that a field at a single point is uh, not normalized, like its variance is large, so it's going exactly, to exactly, 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 yeah, uh, that's exactly the case. So, uh, so that's um, so. The next slide, I will uh, now be taking the scaling limit as n is going to infinity. Uh, Actually, can of, I, can uh, I ask? A, can, sorry, can I yeah. ask? A Brief question for yeah. that. Is there any utility in your approach to going to momentum space where the covariance is diagonal, or is that just does that just not play well with the discreteness here? Um, so maybe actually the um, uh, so the uh, so that's actually uh, I, uh, if you mean by as so if you look if you go into the scaling limit, uh, then the covariance is going to be infinite at the diagonal. Uh, so, uh, so on the previous slide, we're considering a discrete Gaussian free field, which is uh, this no, is actually no, more of a conventional sorry. definition. Sorry, I understand, uh, that, I understand that it looks infinite in the diagonal, even in position space. I'm just saying the covariance is overall diagonal with no off-diagonal terms in momentum space. Um, does that is that of any use to you? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the understand the question. Um, so I think these, it's just yeah. saying, well, I think you have some X and Y that are on some kind of a graph. And I think Eva is saying that if you pick the 
a basis that corresponds to eigenvectors of the adjacency matrix of that graph, then H of F would just be a sum of diagonal terms. Oh, so you want to uh, express um, uh, the Hamiltonian? Yeah, the, uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, both the Hamiltonian and the and the covariance for the same reason Douglas was just saying, it, it, it ends up diagonal, which is a little simpler, but maybe it's irrelevant for what you're doing since you have a very position space, um, you know, calculation in mind. So, but yeah, I was just curious if that ever helped, if that helps you. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm still not sure I understood, understood, uh, I'm just saying. The question. I'm, I'm just saying for a transform this, and you'll get a diagonal covariance. <laughs> I'm sure it's something you're familiar with in some language, uh, but okay. Yeah, there's there's translation invariance, so um, at least discrete translation invariance here, or at least sorry, maybe not discrete translation invariance, but ultimately when you do the continuum limit, you would seem to recover tr um, uh, translation invariance. Uh, so actually, in in this square, I guess one doesn't get. Uh, exact translation invariance because of because the boundary here is uh, one does have a boundary so one doesn't have interaction from between this side and this side. Okay, so the boundary condition was was. Um... Uh, so this was actually uh, I, I'm now considering the free boundary GFF. Um, so it is free boundary, but there is no interaction between between opposite boundaries. I mean, one one could also consider that one could also. Uh, would could also consider it on on a torus, for example, um, but but that's not what I uh, that's not not what is defined here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, uh, okay. So um, the continuum Gaussian free field. So um, so one way to define it is to say that it is uh, the limit of uh, the discrete Gaussian free field when uh, n is going to infinity. Uh, so going back to the previous slide, uh, we see that uh, this discrete Gaussian free field, um, uh, it, is, uh, it is it is diverging like the square root of log n uh, when n is going to infinity. So, uh, so for this reason, it's not obvious uh, how, to, how to take this uh, scaling limit. Uh, and in particular, this uh, limiting uh, Gaussian free field, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is not uh, well-defined as a function. Uh, so if one has some fixed point z, uh, in, in the unit square, uh, then h of z uh, is not well-defined. Uh, but one can argue that uh, this Gaussian free field, uh, it is uh, well-defined uh, as what we call a random uh, distribution or a random uh, generalized function. So this means that if f uh, is some smooth uh, test function, uh, then one can uh, integrate a f uh, against uh, this Gaussian free field. Uh, when integrating h against uh, the Gaussian and then we're integrating f against the Gaussian free field, uh, then one will get some uh, random number. Uh, and this random number is uh, normally distributed. It has a mean zero uh, and it has a variance, which is depending on, on this choice of, uh, of smooth test function f. Uh, so one uh, reason that this Gaussian free field is, uh, is a natural object uh, is because it is a natural analog of the Brownian motion in the case when time is two dimensional. Uh, so, um, uh, so um, uh, if well, you can recall that the Brownian motion, uh, it can be viewed as a random function from R plus to R. Uh, and the 2D GFF, it is a natural uh, analog uh, of this uh, random object um, uh, when uh, instead of considering uh, R plus, uh, one considers some, uh, some subset of, uh, of, the, of uh, R2. Uh, so I can also give a formal uh, path integral definition of uh, the Gaussian free field. Um, so, um, so one can do this by considering a Lebesgue measure on the space of functions with uh, mean zero, uh, and then reweight this uh, by e to the power uh, minus uh, this action, uh, which is given by what we call Dirichlet energy. Uh, so we integrate, um, uh, integrate uh, this uh, derivative of, of phi, um, or this gradient of phi uh, squared uh, over uh, our, our domain. Uh, so going back uh, to the previous slide, uh, you can see that this is exactly, so this is exactly the continuum analog of, of uh, the discrete Gaussian free field defined on the previous slide. Uh, so here we again started with Lebesgue measure uh, on the space of functions, uh, and then we rewrite this by e to the power minus uh, the Hamiltonian, and you can see that this Hamiltonian is exactly the discrete analog of, uh, of, this, uh, of this action. Uh, of course, this uh, path integral definition, it does make uh, rigorous sense, uh, for example, because the big measure on uh, the space of functions uh, is, not, is not clear uh, how to define that uh, rigorously. 
Uh, okay, so um, uh, so next I want to uh, explain what I mean um, by an uh, LQG service. Uh, so um, uh, so to introduce uh, an LQG, so to define an LQ, LQG service, I first uh, choose the parameter gamma, uh, which is between uh, zero and uh, and two. Uh, and then we let uh, age uh, be an instance of the Gaussian-free field uh, in uh, in the unit uh, square. Uh, so yeah, so since there were some questions about the central uh, charge earlier, I can mention that this uh, gamma between zero and two it corresponds to having a matter central charge uh, less than uh, less than one, uh, and it corresponds to having Liouville central charge uh, greater than uh, twenty five. Uh, so Liouville quantum gravity surface, um, it is the surface which can be formally written as e to the power gamma h uh, times the standard uh, Euclidean metric. Uh, so this means, uh, heuristically speaking, that we're considering uh, a surface uh, whose area measure has density e to the power gamma h uh, relative to uh, Lebesgue area measure. Uh, and it means that uh, the boundary measure uh, along uh, the boundary of, of the surface, uh, it, is, it has density e to the power gamma h over 2 uh, relative to, to length measure. Uh, it also means that if we have uh, that we can define uh, a distance function, um, and um, uh, and uh, this is defined by first saying that the length of a path uh, can be obtained by integrating e to the power gamma h divided by some parameter uh, d sub gamma, which I will come back to. Um, so in, in order to get the length of the path, one integrates this uh, along the path, uh, and then in order to get the distance between two points z1 and z2, uh, then one take uh, the shortest the length of uh, the sh the shortest path uh, between the two points. Uh, so this parameter uh, d sub gamma, uh, so this is uh, what I call uh, the dimension of, of the space, uh, and uh, I will be coming back to this a little bit later. Uh, but to connect it to what I was saying uh, earlier, so uh, in the case of these uniform the sample planar maps, then uh, this d sub gamma would be equal uh, to four. Um, so what you can see is that this definition of uh, an LQG surface, uh, it doesn't make rigorous sense um, because uh, H is a distribution or generalized function and not, uh, not a function. Uh, so therefore it's not obvious what e to the power of some uh, constant times uh, H uh, means. Uh, so in the next few slides, uh, I will explain uh, that it is possible uh, to make rigorous sense of, uh, of um, u, nu, and, uh, and d. Uh, and the idea is to consider some smooth approximation, h sub epsilon, uh, to, to h. Uh, but this is, yeah, I will come back to this on, uh, on the next few slides. Uh, so, um, so this construction of LQG, LQG surfaces, we are um, we're interested in this for all values of gamma between 0 and 2. Uh, but the special case when uh, gamma is equal to the square root of eight thirds is playing a special role, uh, and is playing a special role uh, because it describes uh, the scaling limit of uh, of uniformly sampled uh, planar maps. Uh, we sometimes call it uh, pure gravity. Uh, are there any questions to this slide before I uh, continue? Uh, okay. Uh, so then I, um, uh, I can define, as I will first explain, uh, how we rigorously construct uh, this area measure um, U. Uh, so the idea of, uh, of this construction uh, is that um, for some epsilon between 0 and 1, uh, we let h sub epsilon uh, be some uh, regularized version or some smooth uh, approximation uh, to, to h. Uh, so h uh, sub epsilon, uh, it is a smooth uh, function. Uh, so so therefore, we can use h sub epsilon uh, to define uh, an error measure. Uh, so this is the error measure that you can see uh, here. Uh, and then, um, uh, and then it turns out uh, that when this um, regularization parameter epsilon uh, is set to zero, so when the approximation to the true uh, GFF gets uh, better and better, uh, then this error measure, upon appropriate uh, renormalization, uh, it converges to a limiting uh, error measure. Uh, and uh, we denote this limiting error measure by uh, by mu. Uh, so this will be the error measure, which can heuristically um, which can be heuristically described as uh, as the measure having density e to the power of gamma h relative to uh, Lebesgue uh, error measure. Uh, so the construction of uh, error measures uh, of this kind uh, it goes back to the 70s uh, and 80s uh, in works of uh, Hercroon and uh, Kahan. Uh, and I also refer to uh, a few recent papers by uh, Duplantia uh, Sheffield uh, and uh, and a review by Rosa Margas for uh, for uh, for the for a construction of uh, of this kind. Uh, 
uh, so if you look at the figure, um, uh, so this figure is is, give, is giving, uh, you can think of it as giving a contour plot of uh, H sub epsilon. Uh, so H, H sub epsilon is some uh, smooth uh, approximation to age and uh, and the contour plot is um, has been made such that uh, a point gets a color depending on uh, on the magnitude of, of H sub epsilon at, uh, at the point. Uh, so the points which are red, they correspond to the point where H sub epsilon is particularly large, uh, whereas the blue points uh, correspond to points where uh, atom epsilon is particularly uh, small. Uh, so since this uh, error measure, it's uh, heuristically uh, the error measure which has density to the power gamma age uh, relative to the bang measure. So you can also view this um, view this uh, simulation uh, as showing uh, the density of the random uh, error measure relative to uh, Lebesgue error measure. So these uh, the red regions are the high density regions with a lot of um, lot of mass, uh, whereas uh, the green region, no, the, the blue regions are uh, the low density uh, regions. Uh, okay. Uh, so this, uh, so this is uh, the rigorous definition of this era measure uh, mu. Uh, so this boundary measure uh, nu uh, is constructed uh, by uh, by a very similar approach. Uh, so I will not be going uh, through it. Uh, so instead, I will be going uh, straight uh, to this Lewell quantum gravity uh, metric. Sorry, can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Why did you consider that the gamma is between zero and two? Uh, so it is because, for example, so these constructions uh, that we are considering here, they actually uh, don't quite uh, work in the same way when gamma is uh, is in a different range. Uh, so if one um, if one applies such uh, such a procedure um, uh, and uh, let's say gamma is uh, is greater than um, uh, is greater than two, uh, then uh, uh, then it will actually still converge, uh, but it will actually converge to zero. Uh, so it doesn't really give an interesting uh, yeah it doesn't give an interesting limit. Uh, there is, there are actually some um, uh, some recent uh, works where people have also uh, studied um, uh, all the, uh, studied uh, complex uh, and in particular the imaginary uh, values of, of gamma. Uh, and in these works, people have actually uh, managed to show that one can uh, one can construct some limiting limiting object by a similar normalization procedure. So, if, for example, one inserts like an imaginary uh, gamma, then one doesn't actually get the measure because, of, of course, one when one considers e to the power e to the power some imaginary uh, number, then one will get a complex number. Uh, but one can make sense of the analog of a mu as as what we call like a random distribution. Uh, so, so, so there has been done uh, some work also on um, on other values of, of gamma. Uh, but I am uh, so I am considering uh, yeah. So this is this is the, the approach which is. Um, Gamma between zero and two is, is the approach which is is the range which is uh, um, uh, best understood, uh, and it's also the um, and it's also uh, the range for which one can establish, for example, relationships to random planar maps. Um, yeah. And I have another naive question. Actually, is it okay. this amount of gamma that is square root of eight over three? Is it like yeah. you had this number from from random? Uh, probability field and then you insert it here or you did some work and this gamma appeared when you wanted to go to the gravity so which way was that Maybe, sorry it's, i think it's very nice yeah, so uh, how how does this value appear so i um so there are somehow um uh so at least on the continuum side uh one can see that there are uh that there are some of these lpg services or the construction here, there somehow, it doesn't seem like from these constructions, like um, like uh, gamma equal to square root of is playing any special role. Uh, but when one is studying these surfaces and one studies the geometry defined by these surfaces, then it turns out that this particular value it actually does have some uh, particular properties and some particular symmetries. Uh, so this is something I was planning to come uh, back to a little bit uh, later in the talk. Uh, so it is about. Um, uh, one can consider couplings between these LPG surfaces and uh, these random curves that we call Schramm-Learn revolutions. Uh, and it turns out that there are particular um, particular um, uh, properties that uh, that this particular value of gamma is, is showing uh, in, in this coupling with uh, with these SLE curves. Uh, so, yeah. 
then that's where this, this value is coming from. Of course, one can also get the value by, so there's also a relationship from physics between uh, between uh, gamma and the central charge. And one can also see uh, that uh, this matter central charge is equal to zero for the uniform sample of Um But that is somehow taking as an input this relationship between central charge and, uh, and gamma. Uh, but it can actually be derived also directly, uh, um, directly from the math point of view. Okay, if I can ask another question, you mentioned about yeah. this cent central uh, charge. So yeah. in, in physics, we have, for example, the central charge of the, instead of like normal Liouville theory, we can have also for the super Liouville theory, we can have another central charge. So okay. if, do you think there is any possibility having that central charge and having this relation that you have between this gamma and normal C, you can have some prediction for another possible gammas connecting to the super, super central charge? Uh, I'm actually not familiar at all with the with the super central charge, so I am uh, uh, yeah I'm not quite able to answer answer the question. Uh, okay. I yeah yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so there is definitely there are definitely like rigorous relationships between like the gamma and uh, what we call the Liouville central charge, um, which is equal to like one plus x q squared and q is equal to one two over gamma plus gamma over two. Um, and one can actually also, to, for a given central charge, one can actually associate it with, with two different gamma values. Because we think, uh, if one looks at the relationship between central charge and gamma, one can, well, there are actually two solutions. Um, uh, at least for this range, there is also uh, like a dual value of, of, of the gamma. Uh, but I'm not sure if, uh, I'm not familiar with, it, with the concept of like super uh, central charge. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so uh, next I will describe how uh, to define uh, this random metric uh, associated with uh, the surface. Uh, so um, as described before, uh, the idea of the, the constructing the idea of the metric is to define the uh, the length of uh, a path by this uh, integral, uh, and then one defines uh, the distance between two points by taking the shortest the length of the shortest path between the two points. Uh, and um, and just as for the error measure, uh, one has um, uh, so this uh, random uh, metric. Uh, it, it is constructed rigorously by considering approximations uh, to the field. So an approximation h sub epsilon uh, to the field. Uh, and then just as in the case of uh, of the measure, one can show that this metric uh, is converging when epsilon is sent to zero. Uh, as you can see that uh, the formula is it's including some constant c sub epsilon. So this is actually not uh, precisely known. Uh, and it, uh, this constant is simply defined such that the median distance across um, across uh, the square uh, is, is equal to one. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned, the construction of, uh, of the error measure, the Liouville error measure is, is classical uh, and has been known for several decades. Um, but this construction of, of the random metric uh, is um, uh, this was uh, the, this construction was only completed uh, two years ago, uh, in in works of Gunnar Miller and Ding Dunlap, uh, Ding Dubeda, uh, Dunlap and uh, and Falconet. Uh, so this construction of the metric is is much harder um, because you can see that uh, the definition of the metric uh, it involves this optimization procedure uh, over all uh, all paths connecting uh, any pair of points. Uh, in the figure, you can see uh, simulations of, um, of the metrics. You can see a simulation of a metric uh, ball. Uh, the color of a point is indicating the distance uh, from the point uh, to the center of, uh, of the square. Uh, and the points that are black, uh, they have distance uh, more than a half from the center of, uh, of the square. Uh, so you can see that when gamma is small, uh, then uh, the ball is very regular. Um, uh, so you can see that uh, that the geometry of uh, of the LPG surface is not so so different from the standard Euclidean geometry. Whereas for larger values of gamma, uh, there is a much uh, bigger distortion uh, of the Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, so these are simulations made by by Jason Miller. Uh, so um, you see that in uh, in my formula for uh, the metric, uh, there was um, a constant uh, d sub gamma. Uh, so this is uh, what we call a dimension of the surface. Uh, so remember that in LPG surface, it has a distance function or or, uh, or metric uh, d, which is metric d defined on the previous slide. Uh, 
Uh, so D, uh, the metric D is defining uh, a metric space uh, and D sub gamma, uh, we would define it to be the half star dimension of this uh, metric space. Uh, uh, and uh, it is known that uh, these, uh, the D is equal to four when gamma is equal to the square root of eight thirds, uh, but otherwise uh, the value is not known. Uh, so, um, uh, but the graph is showing the best known upper and lower uh, bounds uh, for, uh, for this uh, D. Uh, for, this, for this of gamma, uh, I've also shown uh, a prediction from the physics literature known as the Watabika prediction. Uh, this Watabika prediction is actually known to be false for very, very small values of, uh, of gamma. Uh, so if we go back to just recalling a question from earlier, so this uh, D sub gamma, it corresponds to, uh, to, this, um, uh, to this four uh, appearing here in, uh, in the exponent. So if one consider planar maps in other universality classes, one would need to, to rescale by something by one over uh, d sub gamma instead of one over four. Uh, sorry, and then this um, prediction is based on what? Uh, based on what? The relation between d gamma and gamma. Uh, so uh, at the moment, there is actually not any very convincing uh, heuristic uh, saying what the relationship is. Um, so there was. Uh, prediction uh, from the physical literature, which I included just for comparison, uh, but it has actually been proven to be uh, to be false uh, oh. for very small values of gamma. Uh, and I've also been uh, been told that uh, this prediction was actually also very controversial in the physical literature, and uh, and uh, the derivation is uh, there are somehow known to be certain assumptions in the derivation which are not correct. Mm. Uh, but I still include it for comparison because it's a somewhat well known uh, prediction. Uh, and then uh, otherwise, uh, there are upper and lower bounds uh, that are, have been rigorously established, uh, but, um, uh, but what the actual formula is, is, uh, is uh, very open. Uh, when, if one does simulations, it's actually lying very close to this uh, prediction due to, to Watabiki. Um, the lower bounds and upper bounds are equal at gamma equals zero. I guess that, that point is also known. Yeah, exactly. So that point is also known, but somehow gamma equals zero is just uh, Euclidean geometry. Mm -hmm. uh, so then it's somehow known that areas scale like um, scale like lengths squared. And here we have this other known point at the square root of eight thirds, where we have equal to four. And uh, uh, this is d equal to four, uh, one gamma yeah. in the pure gravity, that is purely based on simulation. Uh, how did you get this uh, four? Uh, no, so the four, um, uh, so this is actually based on uh, computations on planar maps. Oh, okay. um, because if one uh, looks on planar maps, uh, then there are certain, then it's possible to do exact computations in the case of, uh, of, um, uh, of uniformly sample maps. So it has some nice projections and from these projections, it's pretty easy to read off that uh, distances scale like uh, that, well, uh, that uh, the diameter is growing like uh, n to the power of a quarter. Um, and then since one has scaling limit results, one can also transfer this to, to the continuum surface. Uh, yeah. And do you know the behavior when, uh, when the uh, central charge, uh, lower central charge goes to infinity? Uh, yeah, so when it goes to lower central charge goes to infinity, so that corresponds to gamma going, going to zero. Uh, so then it just uh, converges to, to the standard Euclidean geometry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so, so looking at, um, looking at the time, I see that, uh, I think I, I, the talk should be, um, was it maximum? Well, maximum how much? I think uh, we had a lot of questions and I think people are enjoying the discussion so we could stretch it a bit like uh, I would be happy to do that. Maybe you can go on for like 15, 20 more minutes. That would be okay. Okay, yeah. Or more. Uh, so then uh, I guess I have, I could actually do it a little bit depending on what you want to hear, hear about. I can say briefly what the rest of the talk would be about and then so I was uh, first going to say something about non-uniform planar maps and say what is known in this case, which is something is known, but there are, uh, but much less than in the pure gravity case. 
then I was planning to say a little bit about conformal uh, welding. Uh, so here is conformal welding in some other discrete setting, and then we have conformal welding. So this is interactions with SLE curves in the continuum. Um, and then I was planning to say something about conformal um, of mating, what we call mating of trees. Uh, and then I was planning to say a bit about uh, the Liouville conformal field theory. So that would be uh, presenting the Liouville action, define this bracket F, explain how this bracket F is defined uh, rigorously in the math literature uh, by using the Gaussian field. field, uh, then say something about correlation functions, um, and also present the DOZ formula, bootstrap, uh, and then at the end define equivalence. So I'm not sure do you have any preference for which part of this to I should present. Uh, I think I will not have the time to cover everything. Yeah, if I think we are pretty flexible with the time people can, of course, leave if they have time constraints, but uh, I would okay. love to hear all of it if, if you have the time. Okay, okay. People. Well, then I can, uh, yeah. Uh, okay. Then I can, uh, I guess I can just start with um, continuing where I, uh, yeah, where yeah, I mean, I, and I, people I, should feel free to I, say if they disagree. I mean, I'm not like sorry, sorry, I don't I don't disagree. I wanted to ask one question. Maybe this is a slide to do it. I have to go teach uh, soon. But um, uh, are you I, I just have a question I think is relevant, but you'll probably say um, no. <laughs> so the question is whether okay. what we call time like Leoville, where you have a large matter central charge um, and hence the gamma ends up very small. Um, uh, is that something that you can treat rigorously mathematically? Uh, so, um, yeah, so, uh, so the first thing is that um, just if we have a very large uh, matter central charge, uh, then uh, it actually corresponds to, um, uh, to, I think, not having a small gamma, uh, but rather having uh, a complex gamma. Um, so if one inserts, if one lets CM be, be large, uh, then I think one will get uh, a complex value for, for gamma by, if one inserts into, into these equations. Well, yeah, yeah, but, but um, Q, sorry, Q squared, sorry. Um, okay, the, the context I have in mind would give a, yeah. a real but small coefficient gamma in that exponent, but the, the price you pay is a negative kinetic term. Um, that's what we mean by time like Leoville. Uh, Eva, that case is imaginary gamma. That, that's, I think you're, you're doing a field redefinition of the case with imaginary gamma, like you're multiplying the phi by i. But maybe what you're saying we're multiplying the h by i also. I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that. the invariant yeah. thing um, is, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's fine. Usually what we do is we, we indeed multiply the h by i to get the negative kinetic term, and then that would correspond to the gamma by i. So yes, I agree. OK, so go ahead. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so we, we can actually uh, say something. So that was uh, I was not planning to elaborate on it very much. Um, uh, and there's actually also, I guess there is a small typo. So there should be CM between one and twenty-five. Uh, so in the theory that I'm presenting in most of this talk, then we have CM uh, less than one, uh, which corresponds to CL uh, like um, uh, greater than twenty-five. Uh, so in, in the interval, when both CM and CL are between 1 and 25, um, then it is believed um, there are some conjectures which is saying that if, for example, if from the point of view of planar maps, then one should get uh, a tree in the limit. Uh, there has been some recent uh, progress uh, in the math literature on also constructing uh, LQG as a non-trivial geometry for, these, uh, for this, this range of, uh, of the central charge. Uh, and so by non-trivial, I mean something which is different from a CRT. Uh, so I was not planning to say a lot about this, but it's uh, but it also it's, it's it's actually a geometry which can also be uh, defined in terms of uh, the Gaussian free field, uh, but and which has actually a lot of uh, properties in common with what I'm saying. But it's uh, but the geometry is um, is very different. It's it's much more tree-like uh, in the sense that there are certain uh, its surfaces with a, with a large number of singular points, uh, which can be viewed as some sort of infinite tree branches. Uh, uh -huh. uh, which which go out of the surface. Um, uh, so yeah, so there has been uh, has been some progress on on understanding the range when CM and CL are between one and twenty five. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. Just one last brief comment, and then I'll go. But um, okay. the thing that the thing that simplifies it in physics is that if you even go to very large C, uh, then 
even though it's imaginary, it's, it's small. And, and so you have a, a weak interaction in that term. Um, and that's, that's actually uh, allows us to use some of our more pedestrian methods. So anyway, I'm, I'm curious how far you could go with this, but I shouldn't uh, interrupt anymore. Thanks a lot. Okay, no, thanks for the question. Um, okay, so um, so next I will go uh, on to discussing um, uh, planar maps, which are not uniformly sampled. Uh, so, so far in the talk, we consider only uniformly sampled uh, maps, uh, and now we consider more general uh, classes of maps. Uh, so we start by defining uh, a mu central charge greater than or equal to 25, uh, and also a matter central charge less than or equal uh, to 1, uh, which is given by 2 to the 6 minus uh, CL. Uh, so then we uh, let M be a planar map sample at random, uh, such that the prob probability of having or sampling one particular map uh, is proportional to the Laplace determinant uh, of this planar map uh, to the power minus uh, the matter central charge uh, divided by uh, by two. Uh, so here this um, here this Laplace is a particular linear operator, which is defined in terms of the adjacency matrix of uh, of the map. Uh, so one reason that such planar maps are interesting is heuristic, uh, which is saying that uh, the law of a planar map M sampled in this way, uh, in some sense has been uh, reweighted by the number of ways uh, to embed the planar map in uh, a CM uh, dimensional uh, space. Uh, so there is a heuristic known as the uh, de coming from the physics literature, which is saying that um, that the planar map sampled at, uh, at random in this way, it, it's also related to uh, LQG surfaces. Uh, so it should converge to in the scaling limit, uh, to a level quantum uh, gravity surface, uh, where the parameters, uh, where the parameter gamma, uh, is related to uh, the central uh, charge uh, as as shown in uh, the indented equation. Uh, so when gamma is ranging between zero and two, then CL and, and CM uh, are uh, ranging uh, in the interval between twenty five and infinity, and CM from minus infinity to to one. Uh, so this uh, DD cancels, it is uh, best understood mathematically when uh, this matter central charge is equal to zero, because then we're dealing with uh, uniformly sampled uh, planar maps. Uh, and as we have uh, discussed already, so this corresponds to the case when uh, gamma is equal to the square root of eight thirds. Um, so uh, in this figure, you can see a simulation of uh, planar maps in three different uh, universality classes. Um, so we have CL equal to 33, uh, 31, and uh, 26. Uh, so one thing you can observe from the figure is that uh, when CL is larger, then uh, the geometry of the planar map is closer to the standard Euclidean uh, geometry. Uh, and, uh, and when CL is going to infinity, then uh, the geometry of the planar map is converging to the geometry of just the standard uh, Euclidean sphere. Uh, uh, sorry. It, you know, it, it is, yeah. By approach to standard Euclidean, uh, geometry means there's no curvature singularity. Do you mean that? Or? Uh, so I just mean that uh, the geometry becomes the standard Euclidean sphere. Uh, so if one, uh, say if one rewrites by, uh, let's say we let CL go to plus infinity, which means CM goes to minus infinity, mm -hmm. uh, then, um, then we are favoring uh, uh, strongly uh, planar maps for which this uh, Laplace determinant is uh, is very large. Yes. Uh, and it turns out that the maps that um, that have like the largest the determinant of Laplace in, they're actually like regular lattices. So it will mm -hmm. be somehow, it will be just, uh, at least if one was in the plane, it would be some sort of lattice, uh, a regular lattice approximation to the plane. In the plane, it will be some, like uh, the boundary will be some self avoiding groups, right? Um, I guess it depends. It, I guess it depends a little bit on how one would do it. But I, I think, for example, if one takes some sort of local limit of this, if one instead of if one doesn't care about like the global geometry, but just local geometry, I think one will just get some sort of regular, uh, regular uh, grid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then if one looks at the global geometry, then I think it will just be uh, just a standard Euclidean sphere. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So it will essentially be a deterministic object um, in uh, when taking taking that limit. Um, okay, so this is when uh, CL is going to plus infinity, uh, 
so conversely, when Cm is going to minus infinity and Cl is going to minus infinity and Cm is going to plus infinity, uh, then uh, the surface have these uh, long, narrow uh, tentacles. Uh, and um, uh, and uh, it, is, um, it is believed that when if Cm is greater than one, uh, then this planar map is converting the scaling limit to a tree, uh, in a particular tree known as uh, the continuum uh, random tree. Uh, so as I discussed uh, just a minute ago, is that there has also been uh, some progress on assigning a non-trivial geometry to LPG in when CM is between 1 and 25, uh, but I will not be, be covering this in, uh, uh, in this talk. Although I can answer questions if, if someone has, has, has questions about it. Um, so um, uh, it is believed and in certain cases proved uh, that this uh, Laplace determinant to the power minus C over M, CM mi minus CM over two, uh, it is equal to or can be approximated by uh, the partition function of certain statistical physics models. Uh, so for example, if um, uh, we can pick, uh, we can see from this figure that CM equal to minus two, it corresponds to the model known as the spanning tree. Um, and uh, it is a theorem known as the Kirchhoff's matrix uh, tree theorem, which is saying that the number of distinct spanning trees that the planar map is allowing is equal to the Laplacian determinant of uh, the planar map. Uh, so in the figure, you can see uh, a spanning tree marked in, in turquoise. Uh, so this is a subset of, of the edges, uh, which is spanning all the vertices, um, which is connected and which doesn't contain any, uh, any loops. Uh, you can also see that uh, CM equal to a half corresponds to the easing model, CM equal to one corresponds to the Gaussian free field, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so therefore, um, sampling a planar map uh, as described on this figure, so when rewrites uh, by the determinant of the Laplacian to this power, uh, it should be asymptotically uh, equivalent uh, to rewriting by the partition function of some uh, statistical uh, physics model. Uh, so for example, one can sample a planar map uh, at random, such that the probability of sampling a certain map is proportional to the number of, of distinct spanning trees uh, that the planar map is, uh, is allowing. Uh, so there has been uh, various progress uh, in the math literature on understanding uh, the asymptotic behavior also of, of some of these uh, non-uniform planar maps. Uh, so for example, there has been um, uh, in, in several several planar map models, it has been uh, one has managed to prove uh, that uh, they converge to legal quantum gravity surfaces in what is known as uh, matrical trees topology. Uh, so this is uh, a notion of convergence which doesn't uh, directly capture um, uh, conformal properties or metric properties of the planar map, uh, but it allows to prove uh, convergence of uh, certain observables uh, associated with uh, the planar map. Um, then there are also been various progress on showing that uh, certain exponents uh, in random planar maps, uh, they are equal to the associated uh, exponents uh, in the continuum. Uh, for example, there has been some progress on what is called stable maps. There has been some progress on nesting statistics in our loop model, uh, progress on the volume growth exponent uh, in planar maps and show that they are equal to the uh, continuum uh, growth exponent. Uh, and there has also been uh, some uh, progress on, on the ESIC model. Uh, and there's also been some very recent progress uh, by Ang Park, Pepper, and Sheffield on uh, making sense of, of rewriting an LPG surface by the Laplacian determinant uh, directly uh, in the continuum. Uh, but I will not be covering uh, covering that in uh, in this talk. Okay, uh, are there any questions for this before I continue? Okay. Um, okay, so um, uh, then I can um, can mention that uh, most of uh, most of the planar maps uh, we have considered so far in the talk, uh, they are uh, we say that they are maps with uh, sphere topology. So these are maps which are uh, natural to draw on on the sphere, uh, and um, uh, and for which the number of vertices is is finite. Uh, so it's also very natural to consider planar maps with uh, disk topology. Uh, so these are planar maps or are natural to embed in uh, in a disk. Uh, so these are planar maps where there is um, which has a boundary, uh, and this is uh, the curve which is shown in uh, in red. Uh, so one can also consider uh, planar maps with an infinite number of, uh, of vertices. Um, uh, and uh, so here you can see two examples: one drawn in the full plane, uh, and one map uh, with a boundary which has been drawn in uh, in a half plane. 
And so all of these uh, four types of planet maps, uh, they are in many cases believed to, to converge to legal quantum gravity surfaces, so to surfaces where the geometry is given by this exponential of, uh, of the GFF. Uh, okay, so uh, in the next uh, uh, part of the talk, I will be considering uh, planet maps with, uh, with disk topology. Um, so I want to um, want to describe uh, what is known as conformal welding uh, for LKG surfaces, and I will uh, start by giving some discrete motivation. Uh, so it's possible to observe that there is a projection uh, between uh, planar maps um, or between the objects on the left and right side uh, sides of uh, this equality sign. Uh, so on the left side we have a planar map with a disk topology. Uh, it has two marked points uh, on the boundary, uh, V and W, and uh, there's also a self-avoiding path on the planet map connecting these two points. Uh, so this uh, so self-avoiding path, path is a path which uh, doesn't, uh, which is only allowed to visit each vertex um, uh, at most once. Uh, so then in the right part of the figure, we have uh, a pair of uh, planet maps with this topology. Uh, again, the planet maps have uh, two marked points uh, on, their on their boundaries. Uh, so these two mark points that divide uh, the boundary of the planet map in, into a left side and a right side. Uh, and we also require that uh, the, the band, uh, that the length of uh, the right side of the map M1 is equal to the length of, um, of the left side of uh, the map uh, M2. So these two blue curves, they should have the same length. Uh, so the projection, it simply uh, works. Um, so if one is given the two maps on the, on, uh, the right side, then one simply glue them together along these, uh, this blue curve in order to get uh, this map with the self-rewarding path on, uh, on the left side. Uh, so uh, I will now be presenting uh, the continuum analog uh, of this projection. Uh, so uh, in this continuum analog we, of the projection, we start by considering um, a legal quantum gravity surface. So this is a legal quantum gravity surface, which has uh, the topology of, uh, of a disk. Um, uh, and it is a special uh, type of disk, uh, which has two marked points uh, on the boundary. Uh, and nearby these two points, uh, the field uh, of uh, the planar map is, you know, the field of, uh, of, uh, of the surface is blowing up uh, logarithmically. So locally nearby these two points, uh, the field is looking like Gaussian free field uh, plus this uh, logarithmic uh, singularity. Uh, where the value of beta uh, this, is this uh, value here shown in, uh, uh, in purple. Uh, so then we draw uh, a curve on top of, uh, of the surface, which is connecting the two mark points. Um, so this is the curve shown in eta. We assume so this is a random curve, but which is assumed to be independent of, of the background surface. Uh, and it is, um, uh, so this random curve that we draw on top of, of the surface, it is uh, the random fractal curve, which is known as a uh, Schramm uh, Norden revolution. Uh, so the schramm Dorn revolution is a particularly a particular, particular conformally invariant random fractal curve, uh, which was introduced by uh, Otto Schramm a bit more than 20 years ago. Uh, and Otto Schramm, he introduced this curve as a candidate for scaling limits uh, of, of curves in statistical uh, physics models. Uh, and after his introduction of, of SLE, uh, then uh, these curves were also proven uh, rigorously to describe the scaling limit of, uh, of curves in several uh, models, uh, such as the Ising model, percolation, uh, SK percolation and, and so on. Uh, as a leaker, they have a parameter kappa, and we also always assume that uh, kappa is equal to gamma squared, uh, where gamma is equal to, uh, to the parameter of, uh, of uh, the LQD surface. Sorry, Nina, what is the interpretation yeah. of these beta minus and beta pluses? Uh, uh, so it just means that uh, if you look at the field, so this is uh, an LQD surface, uh, and uh, so you have like some Gaussian free field type uh, field in uh, in the disk. Uh, so it just means that you have two marked points on the boundary of the disk, so at plus minus i. Uh, and at these points, uh, roughly speaking, what you have done is to add a logarithmic singularity to the field. I see. So, so these, are, just the GFF, but they are, yeah, adding. these are these are just parameters that are defined by that condition. Yeah, exactly. So you can start by so you can uh, start by picking uh, beta minus and uh, beta plus. Uh, okay. So they have to be they have to be in a certain range. They have to be like less than this parameter q, uh, but otherwise they are some arbitrary uh, real numbers. Uh, and then uh, and then given a beta minus and beta plus, you can define uh, this uh, parameter. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this is um, uh, this is uh, the magnitude of the blow up that you have at the point. Okay. Thanks. Um, Okay, so, um, so you have this disk um, that, you have, that you're cutting with this independent uh, SLE curve. 
so when you cut the, uh, cut the disc uh, by the independent SLV curve, then uh, the disc is split into two uh, smaller surfaces. Uh, the surface is shown in green and the surface shown in, in blue. Uh, so when you split the surface in, in this way, then there are uh, two maybe surprising things uh, that happen. Uh, so the first maybe surprising thing that happens is that this uh, surface shown in, in blue and this uh, the surface shown in blue and the surface shown in green, uh, they're actually still uh, what we call LQG uh, disks. So they are, um, so if we map, map the, the surfaces by conformal map to the unit disk, then it will again be defined in a similar manner as the original surface, except with the only difference that this logarithmic singularities at the two mark points uh, is, is different. Uh, so that's the first maybe surprising th thing that happens. Uh, the second uh, maybe su surprising thing that, that happens is that these two surfaces, uh, the green surface and the blue surface, they're actually uh, independent of each other. Uh, so this is surprising since um, if one has a surface and one cuts it with a curve and one observes one side of the curve, one could maybe imagine that one gets some information about the other side of what's on the other side of the curve. Uh, but in this particular case, it's actually um, uh, the two surfaces on the two sides are actually uh, are actually independent. Um, so this is explaining the first bullet point. So the second bullet point, I am saying that um, uh, that if one is given uh, the, the green surface and the blue surface, one can recover this original uh, configuration by gluing together uh, the two surfaces. Uh, so this uh, is not obvious um, because I require that uh, the gluing is uh, is done by something uh, called conformal uh, welding. Uh, so roughly speaking, this means that uh, one requires that when these two surfaces are glued together, and uh, then the combined surface gets uh, a unique uh, conformal structure. Um, so uh, in the special case, when uh, beta minus is equal to beta plus is equal to gamma equal to the square root of eight thirds, um, then this conformal welding result is actually the exact continuum analog uh, of this bijection. Uh, so if one looks at the left side uh, of this bijection uh, and one takes uh, the scaling limit, um, uh, then the surface uh, will converge to the LPG disk uh, and the self-avoiding path uh, will converge to this uh, SLV curve, uh, where kappa will be equal to 8 over, th eight over 3. Um, uh, yeah. Um, uh, whereas other parameter values uh, typically also have, at least at the heuristic level, uh, they also have um, they also have discrete uh, analogs. Uh, so this result uh, in the third bullet point it was uh, it follows by combining works of Win and Miller and the recent work of Bangsun and, and myself. Uh, so this uh, conformal loading result that I uh, that I am presenting on this slide, uh, so uh, it was proved in the work of Bangsun and myself, but. Um, uh, but it is based on uh, on um, early works about conformal welding. Um, so one work due to Sheffield, uh, and also one uh, work due to uh, Duplantier, Miller, and Sheffield. Uh, so they prove the analogous result if if we consider surfaces which uh, are natural to embed in the half plane because they have infinite total mass instead of uh, instead of in uh, in a disk. If I start with the two disks on the right, um, yeah, what are the boundary conditions that I'm supposed to put on the purple curves? Yeah, so that's actually uh, a good uh, a good point, which I I was not explaining, which I was skipping. Uh, so, um, so the way uh, so a priori one doesn't put any boundary data. Uh, so it's still, uh, so the way these uh, if one looks at the the, uh, the explicit uh, definition of, of the fields, then what one does is to consider Gaussian free field, then adding a particular random constant, and then adding these logarithmic uh, singularities. Uh, but what one has to do after one has done this, one actually needs to condition the two disks to have that this length uh, is the same as uh, this length. Uh, so this is um, so this is also when I say that they are independent, it's actually not 100% correct because it's actually uh, independent but conditioned on these two purple arcs to have the same length. Uh, and when one glue them together, one also glue according to to this length. Um, sorry, then I also have a question exactly okay. on that. So yeah, and then then because we you mentioned that the beta, the way that you got it is from this equation that is written under the under the picture. So then how I mean what how 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 is guaranteed that the beta that you get for the both disk would be exactly the same that you can necessarily have the same length. Uh, so it's uh, heuristically speaking, it's just because this. Um, uh, so when I say, uh, so I'm only saying that the field is looking locally like this. So 
it means that if we zoom in in very small neighborhood around these two mark points, then the field is looking like the GFF plus the singularity. Uh, but if you look at uh, the band, the total length of, of the boundary, then uh, the total length of the boundary is almost independent of the local behavior around these two these two mark points. Is that answering uh, the question? Mm, yes, for one, this is true, but how necessarily you can see that the purple line is the same length in green and blue circle? Ah, so it's, it's actually, it's uh, a priori, they will not be the same. Uh, so it's only that first, so the way um, uh, the way one is doing it, it's actually rather that one, um, uh, that one, uh, um, that one sample these two. Uh, so for example, one, one way to do it is to first sample the length of a purple curve from some, from some measure. And then conditioned on this uh, number one gets, one conditioned on this one sampled, one sampled two independent copies of, of the disk. Uh, so one sample a green disk and a blue disk conditioned on, on the value of, um, uh, of, of the length of, uh, of the purple curves. Uh, so uh, on the previous slide, I, I was presenting this conformal welding result, which is saying that um, if, one glue, if one is gluing together uh, these two disks, uh, one is producing a new disk decorated by a curve. Uh, so this is just one example of a large class uh, of these uh, conformal welding results. Uh, so I've illustrated a few other ones uh, in this slide. Uh, so for example, in, uh, in the, uh, the top uh, left figure, um, then uh, I considered uh, an LPG surface with um, uh, with uh, half plane topology, uh, and it has an infinite boundary length with, uh, with a mark point. Uh, and one can glue together uh, the left boundary uh, of the surface to the right boundary of the surface, according to, to LQG length. Uh, and what one gets uh, then is an LQG surface, which is decorated by a curve, um, which um, comes from the boundary of, of the original surface. Uh, and this curve uh, can be shown to be um, what one calls uh, a whole plane SLE. So it is an SLE type curve. Uh, in a whole plane going from uh, zero to infinity. Um, so this was this result was proved in uh, the work by the Plante Miller and Sheffield. Um, so then uh, there's also um, a result illustrated in uh, in this figure. So here we consider a sphere decorated by what we call an SLV loop. Uh, so this is illustrating the results that if one takes two disks, uh, so sort of variants of of the surfaces considered here, and then one glue these two disks uh, together, uh, then one gets an LQG sphere. Uh, and decorated by an SLE loop. Uh, and again, it is the case that in SLE loop, it will be independent of, uh, of the, uh, the background uh, LQG sphere. Uh, so this result is from uh, a recent work of uh, Angstern and myself. Uh, so then we have this, um, uh, the case of the conformal loop ensemble. So the conformal loop ensemble, it is uh, the loop version of, of SLE. Uh, so one has a disk, uh, one draw, one sample in an independent instance of this conformal loop ensemble uh, on top. Uh, and then it was argued in uh, or proved in a recent work of Miller, Sheffield, and Werner that um, uh, that this uh, the, uh, these CLE loops uh, they break the original disk into a number of independent uh, disks. So the interior of each loop is an independent uh, LQG surface. Uh, there's also a result here due to Duplantier, Miller, and Sheffield, uh, where they consider a disk uh, and they draw a non-simple uh, SLE uh, on top of, of the disk. So this is an SLE which has self-intersections. And again, it is the case that um, the SLE is breaking uh, the disk into dependent disks. And also that if one knows uh, all the disks and how they're glued together, then one can recover uh, the original uh, surface. Um, okay. Uh, so then I was uh, also, um, uh, um, so also planning to say a few words about uh, mating of trees. Uh, so in this work of the plant Miller and Sheffield, they are not only gluing together surfaces, but they're also gluing together trees. Uh, so continuum random tree is a particular tree, uh, which is defined by sampling what we call a Brownian uh, excursion. Uh, so Brownian excursion, it is um, a Brownian uh, motion, which is uh, a Brownian motion type curve, which is, uh, has finite duration and which starts and ends at zero, uh, and which is otherwise uh, positive. Uh, and then, um, uh, so if one has 
sample in search of random excursion, uh, then one can get the continuum a random tree by uh, identifying points that lie on the same horizontal line under the curve. So points that are um, connected via these green arrows, uh, they uh, identify, so we're squishing together the excursion in order to create uh, the tree. Uh, so Duplantia, Miller, and Sheffield, they uh, make sense of gluing together uh, these two uh, trees, so these two continuum random trees. And they prove that when one glue together these two uh, random uh, trees, uh, then the resulting object will actually have spherical uh, topology, uh, and it will be um, uh, it will be, a, an, uh, be an LQG surface um, known as the LQG surface known as the LQG sphere. Uh, one can also get the space filling curve uh, on uh, on the sphere, which is basically a variant of of these these SLE curves. Uh, so by space filling, I mean a curve which is visiting uh, every single point uh, on, on the sphere. Uh, so this matching of trees result just turned out to be extremely uh, powerful. And, and one reason is that it, um, it allows us to encode uh, LQG and SLE uh, via Brandon motion, because the Brandon motion is a very uh, well studied and well understood uh, object. Um, so it has allowed to prove uh, new properties about LQG and SLE, and, it, uh, and this might be a choose framework. It's also essential to, to all uh, convergence results of uh, planar maps uh, to, uh, to LQG. Okay, so that was the, uh, the end of... Sorry, just to understand the geometry. previous slide, it's conveying the idea that yeah. we do some Brownian motion, we construct this tree, we take yeah. two of them, we glue them, and then... Yeah we get an LQG surface. And so yeah. that's like a way to simulate them or just even theoretically analyze them. And so it is a way to theoretically analyze them. Uh, I suppose one could also do simulations, but it's, it is a way to, um, uh, to theoretically analyze them because it, it really, uh, it's really gluing together these two, two trees. It is, it is a rigorous procedure for, uh, for actually creating, uh, for creating a sphere. Uh, and uh, it will be um, uh, like, will do you be, use this uh, yeah. this technique to derive this uh, d sub gamma equals four, for instance, or or that's um, so actually, so this uh, d sub um, uh, yeah, so uh, so so, there, so so it is it is used in in some part of uh, in in some part of it. So um, yeah, so so it so so part of the proof that the, the that the dimension of the LQG metric is for the, the LQG surface is equal to four. Uh, it is based on um, uh, it is based on uh, on this matrix trees framework. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry, you said this already, but could you repeat how you get from the Brownian Brownian motion to the tree? Uh, so it's just uh, based on uh, gluing together. Um, uh, so two, if two points lie on the same horizontal line, then these two points are identified. So you can somehow imagine that you have like an excursion and then you just squish it together. So that all points that happen to be on the same horizontal line lying strictly under the curve, uh, they are identified to a single point. Uh, so for example, this little excursion that you can see here, this will end up be some sort of a uh, little uh, branch of, of the tree, such that this is like, th this will, will be the root of the tree. That's like the, the point mm -hmm. corresponding to, to these two points. And then for example, the highest point on the tree will be maybe this point. And then for example, this little excursion here, it will be some sort of little thing sticking out of, of, of the tree. It I will see. be like a branch sticking out of the tree. I see. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So this construction from going from the random excursion to the continuum random tree is, is quite uh, classical. So uh, googling like the continuum random tree will give uh, will give like uh, many many figures and so on illustrating uh, this this construction. Um, Okay, so uh, are there any more uh, questions to the part on uh, random conform random uh, planar geometry? Okay, uh, so then I can um, go on to uh, the part on Lee will CFT, which will be um, much shorter than uh, the first part. Um, so um, uh, so Lee will. Um, 
uh, yeah, so I, I will be presenting uh, a probabilistic framework to label CFT, uh, which was initiated in a work of David Kubian and Rhodes and Margas, uh, and which has uh, later been developed uh, both by these four authors and by several other people. Uh, so this uh, so this approach um, it is uh, based on uh, Polyakov's uh, work from uh, 81 uh, of uh, quantum geometry of, of bosonic strings. Uh, so to describe this approach, we start by defining uh, the Liouville action. Uh, so um, this is defined by this equation. So here, sigma is a surface. A pi is a function defined on sigma. Uh, G is the metric uh, on sigma. We'll volume, volume form a DVG and Richard curvature uh, R sub G. Uh, Q is equal to 2 over gamma plus gamma over 2, greater than 2, um, known as the background charge, and gamma is, as before, between 0 and 2, uh, and lambda is the parameter known as uh, the cosmological constant. Uh, so uh, I will be assuming that uh, sigma is equal to the, the standard Euclidean sphere as 2, um, and uh, this can be identified with extended complex plane. Uh, I will also fix uh, the metric to be equal to z plus to the power minus uh, 4, where z plus is uh, the maximum of uh, modulus of z and, uh, and 1. Uh, so, uh, so this metric uh, g, uh, it is asymptotically uh, the same as uh, the spherical uh, metric uh, when doing uh, a stereographical project projection onto uh, the complex plane. Uh, but this particular metric g, it turns out to be more uh, convenient to work with, um, uh, to work with uh, in the proofs. Uh, so, Lee will confirm a field theory. It is about uh, the field whose law is characterized uh, by uh, the indented equation uh, at the end of, uh, of the slide. Uh, so, uh, in other words, we're considering a field uh, which can be obtained by considering the Lebesgue measure on the space of functions on a complex plane, uh, and then reweight this uh, by e to the power uh, minus uh, this uh, Leoville uh, action. Uh, so this is uh, also when considering uh, this Lebesgue measure on the space of functions, we require that uh, the function is decaying like minus 2q log um, modulus of z when z is come to infinity. Uh, and this is consistent with uh, defining um, the theory uh, on, on the sphere. Uh, so, um, uh, so this um, uh, bracket f, it should be viewed as uh, the expectation of f of uh, the field um, uh, phi. Uh, where we're using uh, a bracket instead of an expectation, um, partly because uh, the measures we're dealing with are typically not uh, probability measures. Um, okay, so of course this bracket F, as I have defined it here, is not um, obvious how to make rigorous sense of it, because this Lebesgue measure on the space of functions is not uh, a rigorously defined uh, object. Uh, and I will now be explaining how David Kupian and Rosa Margas uh, define this uh, bracket F uh, rigorously. And as we start by recalling uh, the definition of the legal action and the formal definition of this bracket F, uh, we also recall from earlier that uh, the Gauss nuclear field it can be formally defined uh, um, as the field which is obtained by starting with the Lebesgue measure on, on the functions in the complex plane uh, and uh, reweighted by e to the power minus uh, this action uh, S sub zero, where S sub zero is given by this uh, Dirichlet energy as, uh, as before. Uh, so in order to get uh, a finite measure, then we also needed to introduce some additional uh, constraints. Uh, and we will now be, um, be fixing this additive uh, constant of the field uh, by requiring that the average on, uh, on the unit uh, circle is equal uh, to zero. Uh, so we see that this action as of uh, zero, it's not so different from the legal action. Uh, so the legal action is the sum of two terms. If we keep only the first term, then we get exactly this uh, action S of zero. Um, so, um, uh, so I will, um, uh, so based on this uh, observation, I will, uh, so I will first uh, be, uh, so I will be explaining how we get this, um, uh, how we uh, rigorously define the bracket F, and I will first, um, first explain uh, why we should get, um, if we consider D phi, and we rewrite this by e to the power minus S0, uh, I, I will explain why this should give the field h hat given by h plus a constant c uh, minus 2q log uh, modulus of, of z uh, or uh, z plus. Uh, so um, you can see that uh, this expression, uh, it is defined exactly as this Gaussian free field, except that we consider uh, d phi instead of d phi zero. Uh, and if we compare d phi zero and d phi, uh, then uh, these differ in two different ways. Um, so they differ in one way because um, phi zero is required to be hemi zero on the boundary of the unit circle, uh, whereas 
in the definition d phi, we have no such constraint. Uh, so for this reason, we add the constant c to the field, which is sampled from uh, Lebesgue measure uh, on the real line. Uh, then we also um, uh, subtract uh, this term, uh, 2q log z plus. Uh, and we do this uh, because uh, uh, the measure d phi, uh, then we require, for this measure, we require the functions to decay like this as z is going to infinity. Uh, whereas we don't have this requirement on, on d phi zero. Uh, and we choose to subtract this exact term. Uh, so this is related to this particular choice of uh, a background metric. Uh, so uh, this justifies why this, uh, this should be uh, viewed as interpreted as this field uh, h hat. Uh, so now we look, go back to looking at the legal action and we also take into account uh, these two terms which are shown in, in blue and, uh, and red. Uh, so inserting um, the definitions into the, the blue term, we get 2qc. Uh, then looking at uh, this term in red, we see that we have e to the power uh, gamma times phi. Uh, so from earlier, we may recall that e to the power gamma phi, uh, this is the formal expression that we use when defining uh, the legal uh, area measure. Uh, so therefore it's natural to view this red term, uh, at least after taking the integral over the domain, we view it as this legal uh, area measure. And multiply it by uh, by the cosmological constant. Uh, so uh, by making these choices and inserting into the definitions, then we get uh, this uh, rigorous definition of this uh, bracket uh, bracket f. Um, okay, so um, so that's the definition of bracket f. So it, I, I'm recalling this definition. You wrote yeah. that the, you re require the mean of phi to be zero on the boundary of the unit disk, but yeah. it, it seems here like you want uh, um, I don't understand so why. Actually, this so this is actually a somewhat arbitrary choice um, because we're afterwards we're adding uh, this constant c from Lebesgue measure. So somehow, so when we define the Gaussian field in order to get the probability measure, we somehow need to define to somehow fix this additive constant of the field in some way, and then we do this in a somewhat arbitrary way. And but then we're afterwards we're again adding a constant c sample from the bag measure. But why is q times r times phi equal to just that constant c um, instead of? Um, I think is c like the zero the mode of the field? Uh, yes, yeah, so it, it can be. Um, so it can be uh, be argued because if one. Uh, evaluates this, uh, so this curvature, it's actually by the choice of particular choice of metric, then the curvature is actually, it's only supported on, on the unit, uh, on the unit disk. Uh, so therefore when one integrates this, so this is one of the reasons it's so convenient to work with, uh, you work with this metric, um, that ah, somehow okay, so, yeah, when one, yeah. yeah, so when one inserts like the GF, this GFF with this renormalization plus the C, one is left with only, with only the C. Could you write once more the reference metric? Sorry, I think I just missed uh, it. So it's uh, this one. Okay, okay, thank you. So you can see that it has it has a singularity at at the at the boundary of the unit disk. Yeah. So this is somehow where all the all the curvature is. Um, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, so this is, um, uh, the rigorous definition of, uh, of the bracket F. Uh, so, uh, so here I have again, uh, recalled this, uh, this definition. Um, and, um, uh, and it is particularly interesting to evaluate this bracket F, uh, if we let, um, F, uh, be the product of what we call, uh, vertex operators. Uh, so vertex, right, vertex operator just, is a function. Yeah. Just to check, I mean, this integral, the integral over C diverges, right? If you don't have the, enough operator insertions. That... Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, uh, I will, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, um, uh, I'll say a bit about this. So that's these uh, cyborg bounds. Uh, so yeah, I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, yeah, so um, uh, yes, yeah, so it's particularly interesting to, Evaluate the bracket when uh, f is a product of vertex operators, which are functions uh, on the form e to the power alpha times phi or the field evaluated at the fixed point. 
Uh, and it's interesting because these give us uh, the correlation functions, which are, um, are, are the objects encoding physical information about uh, the field. Uh, so uh, we can first observe that um, it's not obvious how to make uh, rigorous sense of this bracket when we when we insert the product of these vertex operators. Uh, so this is not obvious because um, um, because this um, uh, this field phi is typically a Gaussian free field type uh, field, and uh, so it's not obvious what e to the power uh, alpha times this uh, field uh, evaluated at the point uh, means. As you may recall from earlier in this talk, that we made sense of uh, exponentials of the Gaussian free field by applying a regularization procedure. Uh, and we can do this uh, again uh, in the setting of these correlation functions. Uh, so instead of considering um, e to the power alpha times phi, uh, one consider it, considers this uh, regularized uh, approximation uh, to, to the field. So phi sub epsilon is some smooth approximation to, uh, to phi. Uh, and one can show that uh, this uh, smooth approximation uh, to the correlation function is converging when epsilon uh, is sent to zero. Uh, so this is uh, the approach that um, uh, that is taken uh, in the work of David Kubian and Rosa Vargas to rigorously define uh, these uh, correlation functions. Uh, and they also establish certain basic properties uh, of the correlation functions. Uh, for example, they prove conformal covariance. Uh, which is that they uh, describe uh, how these correlation functions change uh, under the application of a conformal map. Uh, they also establish uh, these uh, these hyper bounds, which was um, uh, there was just a question about uh, about this. Uh, so, um, so hyper bounds they give um, they give uh, the conditions for when uh, the correlation functions are uh, non-trivial, so when they are neither infinity or uh, nor uh, zero. Uh, so the cyber bounds are some explicit uh, bounds on the parameters alpha, which is saying when, when this correlation function is, uh, is non-trivial. Uh, and uh, in order for, uh, in the setting of the sphere, one needs uh, at least uh, three mark points in order for, uh, for this to be, uh, for these to be satisfied. Um, okay, so uh, then when as, uh, they also established uh, whale uh, anomaly. Uh, so the whale uh, anomaly formula is describing how the correlation functions change. Uh, when uh, the background metric is is changed, uh, so for this reason, it is uh, irrelevant um, which background metric we use because one can, uh, if one knows the correlation functions for one background metric, one can uh, use this uh, whale anomaly formula and also get it for other background metrics. Uh, so this whale anomaly formula it contains a uh, central charge uh, given by CL equal to one plus uh, six uh, Q squared. Uh, so uh, I also want to introduce this uh, legal wheel field. Uh, so the legal wheel field it's defined almost as this field uh, H hat, um, but um, except that instead of sampling constant C from uh, Lebesgue measure, um, it turns out that we want to sample it from Lebesgue measure reweighted by this uh, exponential uh, term. Uh, so if you look at this uh, 2QC in exponential, this is coming from the uh, e to the power minus uh, 2QC uh, here. Uh, you can see that we also add some um, uh, alpha uh, singularities, uh, and they come because if we have a Gaussian free field, we reweight the Gaussian free field by uh, e to the power uh, alpha times uh, the Gaussian free field evaluated at the fixed point. Uh, then um, one can argue via such uh, approximations uh, that this should correspond to adding a logarithmic singularity uh, to the field. So this Lee will feel this interesting because this is uh, the field which is arising uh, in the scaling limit of uh, random planar maps. Um, so I will also be saying a few words about the DOCD formula and uh, bootstrap. Uh, so um, uh, the DOCD formula it is an explicit formula for what we call this three-point structure constants of uh, the theory. Uh, so it's not so hard to, hard to see that if one uh, consider um, and the correlation function with three mark points, uh, then it can be written uh, on the form of the indented equation. So one has some constant c sub gamma of alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and then multiplied by some simple function of, of the z's. Okay, sorry. Uh, and then these um, exponents, uh, delta sub uh, ij, appearing here and here and at the end. Uh, so these uh, can be expressed uh, in a simple way in terms of the alphas and, uh, and gamma. Uh, so it's not hard to see uh, the general form of this uh, of this indented equation, but what is hard is to find explicit uh, an explicit formula for these uh, constants for this constant uh, c sub gamma 
of alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3 appearing uh, at the beginning of, uh, of the formula. Uh, so this formula is called uh, a frequent structure constant, uh, and it was first predicted uh, by in the physics literature by Dorn Otto and Sabolotrikov and Sabolotrikov, uh, and it was proved um, uh, in the math literature uh, in a work of, from 2017 by Kipian and Rhodes and, uh, and Pargas. Uh, there is a powerful uh, prediction in, in physics, which is saying that if one considers these higher order uh, correlation functions, then it can be expressed uh, explicitly in terms of, of these uh, structure constants. Uh, and uh, this uh, conformal bootstrap, uh, it was uh, established uh, rigorously in, in the math literature um, in the setting of the sphere. Uh, in a work from last year by Guillermo Cupian and Rhodes and, and Vargas, uh, and the same others are also um, are also uh, proving uh, in the working process. They're also proving the generalization to general uh, compact surfaces. Uh, so um, uh, the idea in the case of general compact surfaces is to decompose um, uh, the surface into simpler parts, which are well understood, uh, and then uh, prove. Um, um, and then, and then establish what is um, and what is known as uh, Segal's uh, axioms. Um, okay, um, so that's all I wanted to say about uh, Liwell uh, CFT. So I just have the last uh, slide at the end explaining uh, equivalence. Uh, what I mean when I say that the two approaches to um, uh, LQG are, uh, are equivalent. So we have the random plane of geometry and the Liwell uh, CFT. Uh, in both of these theories, we are studying um, random fields. Uh, in the random plane of geometry, we get fields H sub RPM, uh, which are uh, describing the scaling limit of planar maps, either at the rigorous or heuristic level, uh, uh, and or arise in conformal welding results. Uh, we also have fields LH sub uh, LCFT, uh, which are just these uh, Liouville fields that are defined here, uh, which are uh, constructed based on this uh, path integral approach. Uh, and then it has been several recent works which show that these two uh, fields they are actually uh, actually equal in uh, in law. Uh, so it was first established uh, in the case of three gamma insertions in the work of Aru Huang and Sun. Then Sarkle adapted their approach to the setting of a disk uh, with three mark points on the boundary. Uh, then in the recent work of Ang uh, Sun and myself, we consider the case of um, of two uh, alpha insertions. Uh, so our proof is um, is not based on on the previous proofs, uh, and it's also uh, shorter than uh, the previous proofs. Uh, and based on this result with two alpha insertions, one can also get more uh, general res results. For example, one can recover uh, these two uh, previously proved uh, results. Sorry, what was a gamma insertion? Um... Uh, so it means that uh, when we define um, uh, so somehow it means in in the setting of uh, uh, label label CFT, uh, then it means that these uh, that alpha is equal to gamma. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay. Um, so then in the setting of planar maps, uh, what it means is actually that one sample in the setting of planar maps, it means that one sample uh, vertices uniform at random. So if one has a planar map, one sample a vertex uniform at random, then in the limit this gives the gamma insertion. Uh, yeah. So. Um, so then in, um, in works in progress, both of Ansan and myself and the lamp cooler, we are studying the case of uh, multiple uh, bulk insertions. Um, okay, so I will explain this in a bit more detail, but first, first I can briefly explain uh, this figure. Uh, so this figure is, um, is illustrating a result which one can get by combining the work of Aruhuang and Sun with uh, results previously explained in, in this talk. As we consider uniform the sample triangulation, uh, we sample uh, three points um, at random and independently from uh, the vertices. And then we conformally embed the planar map uh, in, uh, in the planes such that these three vertices are mapped to zero, one, and an i. Uh, and then we saw earlier in the talk that uh, counting measure on the vertices is it's an error measure in, in the plane. Uh, and this can be associated with some uh, field. And by applying the result of Ari Huang and, and Sun, uh, then this field is actually this Liu Will field uh, with uh, gamma insertions at these uh, three uh, points. And since it's a uniform map, it's gamma equal to the square root of eight thirds. Uh, so then in uh, this work in progress with uh, Lamb Killer, we are uh, interested in uh, planar maps uh, decorated by some uh, model. Uh, and um, and where we also have uh, several uh, points uh, sampled uh, sampled from the bulk, 
so uh, for example, in, in the figure we consider, uh, you can see this, that the case of, of two points. Uh, so then we are um, arguing, at least at, at heuristic level, um, uh, that uh, in, uh, in the scaling limit, uh, then, um, then uh, this should give uh, the Lee wheel field uh, with, um, uh, with two uh, alpha insertions uh, at, at the two points corresponding to the scaling limit of, uh, of these two points. Uh, so the way the planar map has been sampled, so it has been sampled by reweighting by the partition function of this O of n loop model, and then uh, also reweighting by uh, the nesting statistics uh, around these two mark points, so that we are favoring uh, configurations where there are either particularly many or particularly a few loops uh, around uh, these two uh, mark points. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't understand this diagram. Maybe you could explain the previous one with the zero, one, and i. And okay. Uh, yeah, so um, so we uh, in the left part of the figure, I have sampled a triangulation, mm -hmm. uh, and then I also sample uh, three marked points, mm -hmm. uh, uniform at random from the vertices. And then at the very beginning of the talk, we were considering formal embeddings uh, of planar maps. Yes. Uh, so I have, uh, we assume that this planar map has been embedded conformally into uh, the plane. Mm -hmm. And then we were also discussing these, that we have like three degrees of freedom, and now we have fixed these three degrees of freedom by requiring that the three red vertices are mapped to these three points. Okay. Uh, so then there is a unique way to, to embed uh, the planar map. Mm -hmm. And then we have, uh, we also looked earlier at counting measure on uh, vertices, which give us some measure in the complex plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, this measure in the complex plane converged to a limiting measure. Uh, and this measure is induced by some field. And this field, Earlier, I just described that it, that it was some field, which can be it can be defined in some explicit way. Uh, but if we also use uh, this result, so R, Wang, and Sun, they proved equivalence of that field and this Leo will field. Okay, I see, I see. So there's, yeah. in principle, two ways of getting the five. One is just from the conformal map, and one is from this formula. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a similar kind of story in, uh, in the case of these uh, loop models. So then uh, then actually even less is known. So it's uh, these conformal uh, results and the convergence results on the conformal embedding are only conjectural. Uh, but one can argue at least at some heuristic level that, so the key point is somehow that uh, reweighting the planar map by these nesting statistics around these loops. The key point is that uh, doing such a reweighting is, is giving these alpha singularities in, uh, in the limit. So this, this, this is only heuristics. Uh, but um, yeah, uh, uh, at least it gives some heuristic picture relating the two, uh, the two approaches. So one can get uh, from the planar map side, one can derive some natural field, which should be the limit of the planar map. Uh, and then it turns out that this uh, field, which is the limit of planar map, it's, it turns out to be actually identical to this uh, Lee-Will field. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Oh, thanks a lot for the beautiful talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thanks for your attention for, yeah, this long. Yeah, this was a marathon, <laughs> but it was well worth it. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I, I, could you say one more time just what the loops were on the last figure? I missed it, um, that the red loops. Uh, so the loops, uh, so we're just considering, so I didn't actually define this model uh, rigorously. Uh, so the idea here is just that in this figure, we're just considering uniform map. So in mm -hmm. this figure, we're considering uh, for each uh, map uh, with loop model, we're assigning a weight. Uh, and, um, and the weight of a certain configuration uh, consisting of a map, a collection of loops and points. Uh, so it's given uh, by product of a number of different things. So it's given by product of uh, a certain constant uh, to uh, to the power number of edges, which are not crossed by a loop. Uh, and then it's uh, multiplied by another constant to the power of the number of edges, which are crossed by a loop. I see. Uh, and then, yeah, and then we multiply by uh, e to the power number of a uh, constant times number of um, loops surrounding the various points. Okay, thanks. Uh... Um, I have a question and two comments. The question, um, 
in the um, you define the length with this um, d parameter e to the gamma h over d. Uh, yeah. Um, but in the Liouville theory on with the boundary, they include this boundary yeah. uh, constant operator. It's just like e to the gamma h without the one over d. Yeah, it's this. The uh, boundary so measure. in the boundary, when is so boundary measure one is dividing by two, and uh, when defining the metric, one is dividing by d sub gamma. So, so the reason is just that. Um, yeah. No, sorry. Go so ahead. it means that somehow the boundary is not a geodesic. So if one if one wants to find the shortest distance between two boundary points, it's not optimal to trace the boundary because if one traces the boundary, one will hit the little points where the field is large. Whereas if one finds the shortest distance in this uh, random metric or random distance function, one somehow needs to trace out some sort of fractal path, which is uh, avoiding uh, the points where the field is uh, is very large. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So, okay, that, that sounds, um, sorry. So in principle, you could define the distance of paths even that are not geodesics using the formula with e to the gamma h over d gamma. So by itself, that doesn't mean that you can't apply that formula to the boundary. But you're saying uh, so it would actually be a little bit. Uh, so it would be a little bit different because, or so um, the thing is that when uh, applying, uh, so when defining this these things rigorously, then one needs to do some renormalization. So this C sub epsilon, it's actually some power of of, of epsilon. Uh, so if one, as you see here, that when one defined uh, the error measure, then one needed to multiply yes. by some power of the epsilon. Yes. Of, of yes. epsilon. Yes. Uh, there is a similar power for the boundary measure, which is just gamma squared over yes. four. Yes. Uh, this is actually also, it's actually conjectured to also be a, an exact power of, of epsilon. Um, yes. But, uh, but it's actually not known. But it, the thing is that the sort of renormalizing uh, constant here is different in the case of uh, the boundary measure and uh, the metric. But is the, so that's why. I guess what's confusing me is why the fact that it's not a geodesic means that we should use a different power of inside the exponential. Um, I, I don't care about the yeah. prefactor powers yeah. of that one. I just wondering why we couldn't apply the formula with one over d gamma for the yeah. boundary length. Uh, yeah, so it's somehow, so let's say we consider planar maps with this topology. So I guess I have some, I have some figures of that as well. Uh, so let's say we have a planar map with this topology, which is very large. It has, um, uh, so it turns out that so one can define something called a Boltzmann measure on, on, these, um, on these maps. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it will typically be the case that, uh, let's say the number of vertices is n, mm -hmm. then the boundary length will be of order uh, square root n. Uh, and uh, if we take two typical points, uh, then the distance will be of order n to the power of quarter. So does this mean that geodesics and the boundary have different fractal dimension? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. So I have a question regarding uh, your uh, uh, definition of, uh, the, um, of the Gaussian field that you uh, discretize on the square earlier. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that you impose that the um, average value is zero. How do you do uh, yeah. How do you do that? You impose some Lagrange multiplier or? Uh, so it's um, so it, one can one way to to do it is um, uh, so it's simply that one can uh, if one doesn't have this constraint then one can uh, one can uh, then one gets an infinite measure uh, yeah. and then uh, let's say you look at um, you look at uh, you just restrict a measure to the event uh, that the mean is between uh, minus epsilon and plus epsilon. Uh, so this gives some uh, finite measure, uh, and uh, then one can show that this um, finite measure, it, it has a law when epsilon is then to zero. That's at least one way to do it. Okay. 
No, I was just wondering also in uh, for the simulations. I guess uh, yeah. it's, it can be applied directly in the, in the way that you have just described them. Yeah, so I think, yeah, so I'm sure there are probably, uh, so there are, yeah, so yes, first of all, I think for the simulations, it's actually for, not for the free boundary GFF. So for the simulations, it's actually zero boundary data. Um, but but one could, of course, also simulate uh, this uh, free boundary GFF. Um, and, uh, and then uh, one can do it, uh, there should be methods to do it somehow more, uh, more directly. But I think, yeah, I think Lagrange multipliers is probably uh, an efficient way of um, uh, of of uh, of doing it sort of more uh, more directly, uh, but probabilistically the object can be defined in in this way by taking a limit. Okay, thank you very much. So if, if I understood right, the um, so to get Leofield with with uh, c not equals to twenty six, you reweighted the uniform measure by either this determinant or in principle by some statistical mechanics model partition function. Yeah, right? exactly, exactly. In, in, the, yeah. in the physics literature, people are in the connection to matrix integral, people have another uh, another way of getting those theories where they introduce not just triangulations, but like quadrangulations and higher. Yeah. Higher, is that been some, some something that you have, that's been discussed? Uh, yeah, definitely. So. Um, so a lot of uh, lots of scaling number results have also been proved for uh, quadrangulations, but uh, think, and also general maps and simple maps and uh, and so on. Wait, sorry, I think that sorry, I um, in order to get the non not pure gravity, in order to get the non trivial um, yeah. theories, one can introduce yeah. both triangulations and quadrangulations, and depending on which theory you need, higher order polygons and tune carefully like the fugacities of those different shapes okay, as an alternative yeah. to weighting by the by the statistical mechanical partition function or the determinant. Okay, uh, so at least, at least so if you consider like a uniformly sampled quadrangulation or a uniformly sampled- and That should be the know, same. That uniform, it should be the same, yeah. But if you have a carefully tuned sampling with uh, yeah, exa both yeah, triangles exactly. and yeah. quadrangles and carefully tuned yeah. the ratio, the, uh, so, so there, are, so definitely when you take, so when you take the, uh, when you take the, the scaling limit in like these type of results, like described on, on these slides, when you rewrite either by this, this determinant or by yes, some sort of yes. mechanics model, then, uh, then, um, then one, one needs to tune the parameters of the statistical physics model to, uh, to the model, uh, to, to the planar mm -hmm. map. Uh, mm -hmm. model that is considered. Mm -hmm. um, is that what you had in mind? Uh, um, I was just wondering whether that that sounds like a third way of getting these same models and I was wondering whether that was something that had been discussed. Uh, so I think I actually th think it is essentially I, I don't quite understand the difference between that and uh, and what is uh, uh, and what is done. So it's basically so when when considering so the, the approach I'm describing on these slides, it's basically just taking some planar map model and then some class of planar maps and then reweighting it according to I guess if you go to, to these slides according to some statistical physical model partition function and then uh, it's implicitly assumed that um, that the, the parameters of the statistical physical model are tuned such that the model is at the critical point. And the particular values, parameter values corresponding to the critical point depends on, on so, somehow the type of planar map you consider. So we somehow several step procedure. First one chooses the type of planar map that one is interested in, which can be a triangulation, quadrangulation, general map, simple map, and so on. And afterwards, uh, one is uh, choosing a model in statistical physics and when it's tuning the parameters of the model such that the model is at the critical point. I think there's another what way is... of doing it without the statistical mechanics model. Oh, okay, okay. Just how, is... how many triangles you have versus quadrangles and higher. Uh, so I think this is for most ways of tuning, uh, this should give uh, the same limit as for... Yes, there are uh, special as, tunings yeah. though where you can yeah, yes. a different theory. Um, without uh, adding so, the statistical mechanics model, the statistical physics model. Uh, yeah, so, uh, so I'm not sure if it is what to refer to, but at least if, 
so if one has, um, let's say, uh, the weight that one is putting on very large faces, so it has a very heavy tail. So one is favoring configurations where, where maps with, which, which gives maps with very large faces. Uh, so then, uh, then uh, one can get other uh, universality classes. So then one gets a lim different limiting object. Um, but one needs to, one needs to, uh, so typically one can, uh, let's say you give me like a vector, which gives like, uh, so that in the, the pth entry of, of the vector, it gives like the probability that the face is as a p angulation. So my the weight given to a p angulation. Uh, if if this matrix has like a very heavy tail, then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. one can get other limiting mm -hmm, behaviors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But if the tail is is sufficiently light, then there is like a large class of vectors which all give uh, the exact yeah. same limiting. Mm -hmm, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, but it, but actually, so this uh, case with a heavy tail, this is actually uh, what I'm calling stable maps here. Uh, and this is. Um, uh, so it has been studied um, in uh, the math literature as well. Okay. Um, I guess what it gives, if one compares it to the statistical mechanics model, then it actually corresponds to taking these loops and then removing everything inside of the loop. So one gets somehow, one is actually capturing a very small fraction of, of the planar map because one is removing everything inside the loop. So there is only like uh, a very small portion of the planar map left after Mm -hmm. Because these big faces, one is putting, one has a lot of like microscopic faces, and these somehow correspond to everything which is surrounded by, by loops in uh, in these kind of loop models. Okay, thank you. Yeah, just one last question. Or, um, in physics literature, also the. So you you had this integral over C in the Liouville path integral, and it was divergent yeah. unless you included a lot of operators. Um, so in it can also be people also consider this integral without operator insertions and a different contour for C, so the integral is finite. I wonder whether that has. Uh, you can just gonna say again what you wanted to do. You wanted to. People also sometimes consider this integral, but uh, without operator insertions, let's say, and with a yeah. on a different contour where the you integrate uh, C over a different contour, so the integral is finite. Uh, so what sort of contours? Like a contour uh, that comes in along the positive real axis and then goes up into plus and plus i infinity. Okay, um, I've actually never never seen that myself. Uh, I think that's um, uh, so. So what is this? Uh, well, I would, uh, so what one, sort of object does this correspond to? Well, I think it it's a definition of the partition function without operator insertions. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, does this... Um, so then, of course, one... Uh, uh, but how does one make sense of... Um, well, for example, so here we're considering... So then, essentially, one has... Um, one also needs to make sense of like a field which, where one adds an imaginary, I guess, yeah, I guess one can, one can do that. One can add, uh, um, well, yeah, it's, it's not entirely clear to me how to make sense of I think somehow, this term, I, I, for example. Well, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you what you thought might be the interpretation of the, roughly the, my vague impression is the interpretation of this in terms of the microscopic surfaces is that the divergence of that integral when c goes to minus infinity corresponds to very small surfaces and the, uh, the, yeah that's right and that's that right. if we imagined enumerating surfaces and summing over them that there could be yeah. some some uh, details of the sum that don't depend on the continuum limit but that dominate the answer having to do with very small surfaces or crinkly surfaces and that the the integral that's done along this other contour that gives a finite answer yeah. somehow directly yeah. isolates the continuum part of the part of the uh, statistical problem. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. So I think, at least from my point of view, I think like um, when adding, when integrating against this contour, which would then also 
Um, so it's, I, I would struggle a bit with making sense of, um, making sense of this uh, path in the role approach in, uh, in that case. Um, since one, so one would add, uh, one would add like, so you were saying, what you were saying is to integrate against when one reaches the origin to just go up along. Yeah, to make it completely precise, there's and, one additional step, which is that you take the gamma parameter and give it a yeah. small positive imaginary part. Now okay. we choose a contour yeah. for C, which goes yeah. along the positive real axis and then yeah. goes almost parallel to the imaginary axis, but slightly negative real direction. Okay. So that one will take care of the the problem. I think that you're worried about involving the exponential term. And yeah. The, although I guess one would one would so in, with this approach, there would still be some range of parameters where one would need to deal with real C, and then it would be an issue with it. It might be an issue with this um, uh, with this uh, complex uh, gamma. Uh, so one is able to make sense of this. Uh, this measure mu for for some complex uh, gamma, but it will it would not really be a measure. It will be mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it will be a distribution. Uh, well, I, I guess I guess I guess one could actually evaluate of course this one could evaluate this distribution uh, integrated against uh, the plane or over or the full uh, plane. Um, yeah, so I, I guess may, maybe one could define. Maybe one could, in this way, define some um, uh, some value for could define this bracket. Um, uh, but there's actually also one one interesting perspective, which is actually that um, in order to define this Lie wheel field, one actually doesn't re really need this uh, bracket uh, to be well defined. Uh, so you see that this is so this Lie wheel field is actually uh, what is describing the scaling limit of uh, of planar maps. Uh, and uh, um, and uh, in order to define the level field, one doesn't actually need mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one mm -hmm. doesn't actually need this bracket to be finite. Mm -hmm. So this can be defined. I said that for the bracket to be finite, one needs at least uh, three singularities. But in order to define this, one can use one singularity if one wants. Uh, there is like one caveat, which is that this parameter c is sampled from a measure which is always going to be infinite because it's this Lebesgue measure and then reweighted by this exponential, which mm -hmm. can either be, depending on the sum of the alphas, it blows up either mm -hmm. when c goes to minus infinity or plus infinity. Uh, but at least one can define this Lie wheel field, and one can actually, uh, even in the cases where the measure is infinite, so the measure is always going to be infinite, uh, but one can still make sense of it uh, as a scaling limit of planar maps. So one can also consider infinite measures on planar maps and make sense of uh, make sense. Of, so this measure describes. Uh, the scaling limit of, although it's an infinite measure, it's still the described scaling limit of planar maps because one can work with infinite measures on uh, mm -hmm. on planar maps. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, no, it's, it's definitely uh, an interesting direction to um, uh, to sort of yeah, tw twist twist the parameters and try to somehow um, define the theory for. For like a larger range of parameters, including ranges where one gets uh, imaginary or, or complex numbers. Uh, there is uh, currently not uh, not much progress on this. In, I mean, the, the, yeah, there, there is some progress on math, but it's somehow a very incomplete picture. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. I think we've gone on for a long time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's thank uh, Nina again. And thank you for the very yeah, nice talk. I think this was at the very right level for us. And I think we learned a lot. Okay, great. Uh, you put a lot okay, of effort great. into making it accessible to us. Thanks. Thanks a lot for that. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your patience and all your questions. Yeah. I'll stop the recording now. <laughs>